Notre Dame fans, welcome back to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It is Saturday, and you guys are going to soon learn what that means this summer. That means it is time for the RTCF show recruiting team, Notre Dame related, and then some college football stuff. So, Sean, today we have an array of topics. We're going to talk a little bit about summer recruiting. We're going to the Notre Dame team aspect. Next week, we're going to start diving into specifics of the 2022 team and yeah. different aspects of that during the weekly show and in our Saturday show. We're going to talk about those things. We're going to talk. We're going to kind of put a bow on the dynasty conversation that we started on the show and talk about. Okay, we both agreed last week that Notre Dame can be a dynasty. Mm-hmm. We both agree, which we didn't say, but we believe they're not now. But so, what needs to happen to get there? And and so we'll dive into that. And then the last part, we're going to pick three teams that we think going into 2022 are being vastly overrated. We're going to pick three teams that we think are being underrated by the national publications. We're going to pick a sleeper team. And then we're going to talk about Clemson because we had a hard time finding where to put them into this list. So we're going to talk about them as well. So, Sean, let's kick it off with a little bit of recruiting discussion, man. Let's talk about it. We have begun the most important month in recruiting in a long time for Notre Dame, right? We have visits, 23 kids, 24 kids, some 25 kids even on campus, either for the Irish invasion, which started which starts on tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. And mm-hmm. we have, we've had some positional camps this week and some visitors coming in each weekend that are very important. And the discussion we want to have today, IB Nation, is What are some of the biggest obstacles facing Notre Dame that might cause them to not be able to close on some of the top prospects from the 23 class, specifically going into the month of June? What are some of the biggest obstacles that could keep the coaching staff from closing like most of us think they can and most of us think they should? What are some of those obstacles? Brian, you can go ahead and start it out for you. You know, what are some of those biggest obstacles? What's that's, what's the top obstacle, in your opinion? I think for me, it's still convincing offensive recruits that this is mm. – you've got to get them to buy into what you think they can be. I think yeah. defensively, it's, it's part of the reason it's been easier to sell defensively, Sean. It's not just Marcus Freeman and all that. That's a huge part of it, right? Yeah. But you've got something to show. Like, look, yeah. you've been pretty good defense the last four or five years. You know, I mean, you can say to a big time defensive lineman, hey, look, we've had X number of kid defensive linemen get drafted in recent years. You know, we had five defensive ends from one roster go to the NFL. Four of them got drafted. We had a first round draft pick a defensive tackle. You know, we've got two defensive linemen projected to get picked in this upcoming next year's NFL draft, maybe three, depending yeah. on, you know, if Justin Adamiola can sneak into the end of the draft. And so you can sell that, right? Like you can sell linebacker to a degree. You've had Manti, Jalen, Jeremiah Wusukoromoa, Kyle Hamilton just won the first round. There's there's a lot to sell on defense with the exception of corner. On offense, other than offensive line and tight end, two positions they're not having any issues recruiting. No, <laughs> it, it, it's all. it's you're they're still selling to be done. You know, yeah. if if Notre Dame was more explosive offensively, if they could have played the whole year like they did the last six games, then you know, maybe there's some big time kids already committed in this class. But that's not the case, and so Notre Dame is in a situation where they've got they've got a lot of convincing to do of of top prospects. And I, I agree think that's with the you. one thing. I agree with you, and I'm going to give a different perspective of that. And when you talk about recruiting offensive talent, what you pointed out is very true. We might not like to hear this, but this just happens to be the case. You know, let's take Tennessee, for example, who has Josh Heupel, who has been known for years as an offensive coordinator and as a head coach as somewhat of a genius. He played the position of quarterback. He can relate to quarterbacks. And if you're going to start off any offensive class, you would love for it to start at the quarterback position. And with that being said, he was able to go out and get Nico Amaliva to commit to Tennessee early. Marcus Freeman is not an offensive guy. He's just not. He's not an offensive guy, but he's the head coach. Some might say it's easier when you have an offensive guy as your head coach. It makes it easier to recruit that side of the position because there's relatability and there is lingo when you're communicating with those offensive recruits 
that can come from the head coach that might not be able to come from your head coach when he is a defensive guy. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Just wanted to give a different perspective on that. I think that's a great point. And I think that the, to, to add on to your point, Sean, is it is the fact that no matter what we think about Tommy Reese and his potential and what he's done and how he's overcome certain things and what we think he can do, he doesn't have a track record. So, you know, you yeah. don't have a situation like where Oklahoma just hired, they're, you know, they're having a coaching turnover. Even though Brent Venables is a defensive coach, he's able to say, hey, look, this is Jeff Lebby. Look what he did at mm-hmm. Ole Miss. Look what he did at other places. Right. You, you know, you've seen things like that where, you know, you look at Texas. Why has Texas recruited the offensive side of the ball the last couple of years? They have an offense, like to your point, they have an offensive head coach. Tennessee yeah. is another example. Yeah. And so this is why this year is going to be so important. But the the point is, this if Tommy Reese can do what I think you and I both think he can do this year, then then we're going to have a different conversation next year. It, 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 but but that's not here yet. That doesn't yeah. have anything to do with June and July. Right. You know, and, and so they've done a good job on offense. Braylon James was huge. But let's be honest. Notre Dame primarily got Braylon James based on relationships and academics. Not because he's like, wow, I see myself being a 90 catch, 100, 1400 yard guy. Yeah. Right. And now, yeah. does he want to be that guy? Of course he does. But Braylon, Braylon's one of those kids, one of those top 100 kids who was looking at a whole lot more than just, am I going to get mine on the field? Yes, he thinks he's going to get his. And they've had some good receivers and that helps. But it's it was it was the bigger picture thing, because if Braylon James is only making a decision based off of, where am I going to catch the most passes? I, I don't think he's committed to Notre Dame right now. Yeah. He's just one of those bigger picture kids. And, you know, offensive line, that's an easy sell, right? Running back, they've they've done okay, but they've gotten solid top 250 guy in Jane Lamar, not a elite top 100 or, or five-star guy, right? So in tight end, obviously they've got a very good tight end committed, but that's not a position that's very hard to recruit in Notre Dame because you have a track record. And so I still believe closing on the top offensive players, the Jaden Greathouses, the Richard Youngs, the Jeremiah Loves, the you know the the Ronan Hannafins, the Christian Hamiltons, the 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 even even on the offensive line to a degree, not so yeah. much on Charles Jagasaw, but on a Monroe Freeling. You know, it, it, can you get in the game down the road during a season with another player? Maybe, but once a kid picks another school, it's going to be like, for example, Sean Carnell Tate, kid you're very close with. It's going to be a whole lot harder to have to flip him down the road than it would be to land him now. Yeah. Because even if you go out and have a big year on the field, unless you just blast Ohio State in the opener, and you know he's comfortable not taking NI, you know, not not taking as getting as much NIL money. You, yeah, maybe you could flip him from Ohio State or Tennessee, right? Who two off two teams? But the problem is those teams are also going to be scoring points on offense this year. So it's not like yeah. they're not going to be scoring on offense. So it's much harder to flip a kid like that from that kind of program than it is to land a kid the first way. And that's why I think that's the position that they're still falling behind. So, yes, Marcus Freeman can sell himself, and Chad Bowden's doing a great job, and Tom Reese is doing a good job recruiting, and all that stuff's going well. But they just don't have the product to sell at running back, receiver, quarterback right now, and then just offense as a whole to to really be able to use the product to land these top kids, which is why I think they're having a little harder time closing as easily and quickly as they were on a Keon Keeley. And – a Brennan Vernon and a Drake Bowen and and Peyton Bowen and guys like that because there was something they could point to and say, look here, and they just don't have that as much on offense. And it's something you pointed out. I actually talked to Drake Bowen on yesterday, and he was very upset. He was saying they keep dropping me, and they haven't even seen me play. Like they keep dropping me in these rankings. They haven't seen me play. And, you know, myself, I'm talking to him. Don't worry about it. Just go out, win another state championship. You're you're fine. That'll take care of itself. And he's like, no, you don't understand. Like, it hurts me, you know, being able to go out and recruit when they see me dropping. And I really, you know, don't hold as much weight with recruits. And I'm like, yo, I never even looked at it like that. I'm like, you know, and if he feels that way, then I'm like, yo, maybe this is something I need to bring up tomorrow. Like, with this be an obstacle as well. But going back to what you were saying before we even transition to that, what do you think about the buzz coming off of each weekend 
in June. Is that going to be important to get some of these guys to go ahead and to be closed by Notre Dame and oh, yeah. the coaching staff? Because the offensive line has, like you said, offensive line in Notre Dame, there's a resume there. And right. the coach that created those guys, he's back. Right. So you would think, you know, Jagasaw, we we all feel like at this point that Jagasaw will end up in Notre Dame. Monroe Freeland is coming down pretty much between Clemson and Notre Dame. Seems to be, right. yeah. And Joe Odding, I think, will be on campus as well in June. Another kid that they're in on. So what is it going to take to close the deal? Because most fans, IB Nation, I'm sure – they probably feel like the O line should probably be completed by now. Like we're in O line view. Like right. kids know what we do with O offensive linemen. Why haven't we gotten more than two in the class right now? Right. And June's gonna go a long way to that. Yeah. But the obstacle to that right now might be what, in your opinion? I just think it's who you're going after. And you happen okay. to go after two kids who had reasons that have nothing to do with Notre Dame for why they're waiting. I mean, you've covered yeah. Charles Jackasaw's situation yeah. very closely, and he's not going to make a decision without his mom being on campus first. Well, because yeah. of her job, she hasn't been able to do that yet, right? And, yeah. you know, I, I think they've done everything they can do to put themselves in a good position now. It's about closing in June when you get mom on campus. Yeah. And, and, you know, Monroe Freeling, I don't know if Notre Dame could have do, done a better job. But he's a kid that has told Ryan he's been adamant with him and his family from the beginning that he's going to care take this out longer. Maybe Notre Dame can change turn that change that in June. But you know, I think it 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 I, I think that's really kind of been the factor. Elijah Page, kid's never been on campus before. Yeah, and he's not a highly ranked guy, but I mean Notre Dame loves that kid because yeah. they care more about film than they do what rivals and on three and two four seven thinks, which is yeah. what every fan should care more about. And so I think those are the reasons why they're recruiting a couple kids that are out of your typical region. So when you look at some of the guys that, you know, that Harry Heastan recruited and got, you know, was able to get early, not all the kids in their name landed, he got early. I think Quentin Nelson was kind of a later decision. Ronnie Stanley yeah. didn't decide till December, December, but most kids committed earlier. Right. And, and, you know, Alex Bars committed early, Sam Mustafer committed early, Mike McGlinchey, comm- Steve Elmer, but all, the vast majority of those kids were, were, Notre Dame regional kids. McGlinchey's from PA. Hainsey was from PA. Mm-hmm. Eichenberg's from Ohio. Kramer's from Ohio. Uh, Josh Lug was from uh, Josh Lug is from Pennsylvania from, from Pittsburgh. They've gotten their Aaron Bankses and stuff like that earlier, but but even then, it's just like it's one of those deals where they're just recruiting a different kind of kid. And Harry Heastan get, didn't get hired till January. So, you know, he's starting from scratch in this, that situation. So I think those are the reasons, and it's a little bit different than the reasons why I think they haven't been able to kind of close out the deal with some of the receivers. Number one is I think a lot of this is, is a lot of these kids are dead set on taking officials first. And to be honest with you, I think that's smart. I, I think kids should make wait. I, I hope we – I would – if you could say, hey, I'm going to be football king for the day, what's one of the things that I would do? I would, I would tell, I would be, I would find a situation where I could tell every kid, Hey, you know, unless it's the school you grew up wanting to go to, don't pick a school until you've been to at least four different places. Yeah. Like four different places that you definitely have, are encouraged to see, you know, that, that you definitely would be interested in, right. Go yeah. to at least four schools. And, you know, like, like Dante Moore had made a comment about, you know, I, the officials are a different type of deal than the unofficials. And, you know, he wants to get the whole feel for it. I, I wish kids would be a little bit more thoughtful. Now, I know Notre Dame fans don't want to hear that. And, and no. to be honest with you, if I'm just looking at this from a Notre Dame fan standpoint, I don't want to hear that either. But for me, it, it's more about, you know, what's right for the kids. I think more and more kids are waiting. Some of it has to do with NIL, right? The, the more yeah. places you visit, the more followers you get on, on – uh, uh, you know, the, the more followers you're going to get on Instagram and your socials, which then leads to, you know, better opportunities for NIL deals. I mean, that's, we have to, that's kind of part of it too. So, you know, that, that's just kind of, uh, those are the factors in it. But I think when it comes down more so to the, the skill players, I think a lot of it has to do with, there's just Notre Dame is doing a great job of convincing them what they want to be, but they don't quite have as much as what they are. Now to a degree there is, because you can kind of point to the last six games of the year. 
but you know, Lincoln Riley can point to the last five, six years. You know, yeah. Josh Heupel can point to the last four or five years going back to UCF. Steve Sarkeesian can point back to multiple years, and that's a challenge. And then the final piece is Sean is they're going after better players. And when you go after better players, it usually takes a little bit longer to to close them. So what what does Notre Dame need to do? Like I, you know, this summer it's you've got you know you look at that first weekend of June tenth, Sean. And you look at the kids that are on campus that weekend, and this yeah. kind of goes back to your original question. The buzz, I think, aspect is very intriguing because when when you when you look at that June tenth weekend, and you've got like, for example, let's talk receiver. We we discussed this in a show recently, and I can't remember if it was Ryan or Vince that said it. I think it was Ryan, but we were talking about, or maybe it was you last week. We're talking about dominoes. Right. Yeah. And Ronan, last week. Yeah. Okay. Ronan Hannafin being that domino that June 10th and 12th weekend. Like if you mm-hmm. can get him to commit, like just okay, stop taking more visits. You've already gone to Clemson. You know where the choice. Pick us now. Yeah. How does that then because the, the next weekend you've got Jaden Greathouse coming on campus? You've got Rico Flores coming on campus, and you've got Christian Hamilton coming on campus. Oh, I'm sorry, you got he, Rico Flores on campus the week he's on camp. Ronan's on yeah. campus. Yeah. And then you've got Jeremiah, you've got uh, Jaden Greathouse and Christian Hamilton coming on campus the next weekend. If Ronan jumps into class and Notre Dame is now halfway to their minimum need, now all of a sudden it's like, okay, Jaden Greathouse, we know you love us. We know we're your leader, but hey, man, w- w- when are we doing this thing? Because we're, we're, we're in the middle of doing something and, and you jumping on board now really helps us. And and I think the thing they can do too with those guys is, is like, look, Ronan's on board, Braylon's on board, Jaden, we need to get you on board. Why, coach? Because we're trying to get this cat from Detroit named Dante Moore, and we're we're doing the reverse order of what we thought we were going to do. Because what we thought we were going to do was get him to then put the class together. Yeah. Well, now you've got to put the class together to get him, to help get him. It's not the only reason, but to help get him. And so I think those things can build on each other. Same thing with offensive line. You know, like if Elijah, if they can just crush it with Elijah Page this weekend and maybe get him to commit over the next couple of weeks, I'm not saying that's yeah. going to happen. That's completely hypothetical. You know, maybe then that helps you with with Monroe Freeling. Like, look, man, you want to be here. You know, you want to be here. We want you here. You're our you're our top left tackle. You've got this arbitrary going to go into the fall thing, man. We need you to. We need you to. You know, we need you to. If you really want to be here, we need you to 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 make this thing happen. Yeah. And I think all those things build on each other. And then defensively, I think too, there's a lot of that there as well. I, I think defensively, it's 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 about closing out the deal. It's a yeah. little different animal. There, there, it's no, there's no buzz because you only got one defensive lineman you're going after, right? Right. You 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 get Jaden Osbury as your guy. And then there's like two or three corners that that you're trying to get. And and so and one like Christian Gray, no matter what the buzz is, he's not committing till July fourth, right? right? And so it's already said, now, yeah. yeah. Now maybe they can knock it out of the park with him and and convince him to to make a silent commitment, but then go maybe tell other recruits, that, hey man, I'm on board now, yeah, or at least allow him to you know give you the okay to to let other corners know like, hey, Christian's already committed, so we got one spot left. So if you want to be here, you know we we can't be messing around. If you want to be here. We need you to be here. So I think there is a little bit there in the secondary, Sean, but when it comes to the defensive line, it's just about do, you know, defense front seven. It's just about do what you got to do to get this job done and and get those kids. That's really going to be the key for me. Now I want to ask you something because you talk about buzz and there was a move made on a top recruit. Some might say the number one player in the state of North Carolina out of the 23 class wide receiver, Mm-hmm. Christian Hamilton, and you brought his name up. He'll be coming in June as well. You have the receivers that are still on the board. And I want to make sure that Notre Dame fans understand, don't look at Christian Hamilton as, oh, does this mean that we're not in a good place with Ronan Hannafin or Great House right. or the other receivers? No, 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 no. This is actually a great move mm-hmm. by the Notre Dame coaching staff. Like, okay, if you guys – are going to go and continue to play this out and think about it. And we're going to jump on other top players. Right. We're going to bring them in. And well, the other fall in love, I mean, you we talked about this with Ryan yesterday. If Christian Hamilton comes in and says, "Yo, I want to come." The staff more than likely oh, is going to there's take There's no him. question. 
Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the way that they handled Christian, I think Christian Hamilton is a great example of why this staff is different. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm going to pull his highlights up so people can watch while we're talking. Because he's a really good football player. Well, are you pulling out the junior highlights or junior the freshman highlights? Because the freshman all, highlights are fantastic. Yeah, they're they're really good. I'm gonna pull up the junior highlights. The thing the thing about this recruitment that I that I just love, Sean, is is that the staff did a great job of. They have been recruiting him the whole time. Mm-hmm. I, I actually wasn't aware of that. I didn't realize that they had been recruiting him as long as they had. Cause I remember when he made their top 12, like in like January, February. And I'm sitting there thinking like, wait a minute, hold on a second. Like, okay, they're in his top 12. Cause there's other kids that they put Notre Dame in the top 12. And I'm like, I know Notre Dame's not recruiting that kid. Like Marquise Williams running back from Pennsylvania, put him in their top seven. Yeah. Like they're not really recruiting him. Caden Proctor put him in the top seven. And I was like, uh, not, they're yeah. not recruiting him. There's, which is a great sign that more and more kids are putting Notre Dame in their top groups, even though Notre Dame's not really recruiting, because it just kind of shows that that you know how kids view Notre Dame. But they have been recruiting Christian Hamilton this whole time, knowing that Rodney Gallagher was going to make a decision in July, you know, get him on campus and those kind of things. But you know, when they thought they were getting Rodney, because there was some rumblings that I had from some pretty good sources that Rodney Gallagher gave us either gave a silent commit to Notre Dame in the the blue gold game or gave them about as close as you can get to that. Yeah. Now the staff didn't take that for granted, rightfully so, because as you and I know, Sean, when I told you that back in April, I didn't feel good. I didn't feel good about that silent commitment as I did others. And I almost let it slip, but uh, who who some others were, but there's other guys that are silent commits that I feel really good. This kid's really explosive. Uh, It's so explosive. And, And this isn't, this isn't Charlotte. This is in North Carolina. He's playing quality competition. Yeah. But I just and, – and so they kept recruiting Christian, though, which is smart. And and as you've – as I found out in the last week or so, the, how involved they've been, it's like, okay, wow, this staff is different, man. They they don't – they don't assume they're going to get kids until they – those kids – they've gotten those kids. Exactly, exactly. And so, like, they didn't just get on this kid, and now they got him to visit because then it would be a little harder to land a kid like that. If you're going to get this kid out of Charlotte, he's looking – He's going to visit North Carolina in June. He's Clemson's looking at him. He's been on campus at Clemson a bunch of times. The only way you're going to get that kind of kid is if you've been on him for a while, and they have. And it just goes to show that this staff is just different, man. But it, this is him him being on campus and them really turning the heat up on him is more about, okay, Rodney's not in the class anymore. And right. from, from what I was told at the time, even before Rodney committed to West Virginia publicly, is that when he told Notre Dame staff that he was going to do that, they tried to get him to change his mind. But once he committed to West Virginia, they're like, we're done. Right. Because there's a lot, that decision. I mean, and I got, nobody has any ill will towards Rodney. No, it's like, Hey man, you gotta do what you gotta do. But sometimes the decision a kid makes reflects who that kid is. And I don't mean this in a negative way at all. It, it, it's just, okay. Is that really a guy that we're going to take on a national scale and playing the games we're going to play in is that really the kind of kid that wants to be in that spotlight that wants to be surrounded by other dudes yeah or does he kind of want to go close to home be a big fish in a small and there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that decision by Rodney but that decision tells you a little bit about you know who that kid is from a from a what he's looking for standpoint and I, I really feel like I want people to understand when I say who that kid is that sounds like I'm taking a shot at Rodney Gallagher. It is not. It's every kid's got a different personality. Every kid's looking for different things. It's just about understanding and recognizing as a staff. That's great ball skills right there. That's Solomon Absher's team, by the way, uh, who they're playing against in that in that in that shot right there. It's just more about this is what he's looking for. Checking that box of okay, that doesn't fit what we need. And now that's this is what I'm talking about. This is Solomon Absher's team right here. And so I think that was the eye-opening thing for Notre Dame was, okay, that's why Notre Dame's not rec- still recruiting him where other kids that have committed elsewhere, they're still recruiting. And, and Christian Hamilton obviously is that kid that they're like, okay, we like this kid a lot too. Yeah. he He's a, a little bit more – maybe he's not quite as explosive as Rodney was, but he's a more natural receiver than Rodney was. And and so that that's why he was the guy – they immediately – started turning the heat up on Christian Hamilton. But if they weren't already on him, Sean, it wouldn't have mattered. They yeah, wouldn't. They're, you're not getting him out of North Carolina no. or, or, or away from Clemson if you just now turn the heat up on him. So yeah. you talk about the, the importance of June. This is your chance 
this is the probably the only chance you're going to get to really become a player in this recruit. If he, if you don't knock it out of the park with him when he comes on, I think he's coming on the 17th, right? The weekend of the 17th. That's correct. If you don't knock it out of the park with him, then you're you're not going to be a player for him because this is your official for him. This is his official. And so that's another important one. There's there's some there's some make or break visits happening this summer too, Sean. Where if you don't really have a great visit this time, you may not get another crack at this thing. Or you may fall so far behind with other kids that you just like like if if they're gonna have a shot at Caleb Downs, it has to be now. Has to right? be now. They, they have to they have to just something has to happen, something has to be said, something has to be done in that June visit that just says, you know what, man, like I can see myself at Notre Dame. They they've presented something to me that's every bit as good, if not better, than Georgia or, or Alabama. I could go to those schools and win another one, or I could go to Notre Dame and become a legend. Because here's the thing I would say to Caleb Downs. If you are a starting safety on a team that wins the national championship in Notre Dame, you're a legend. I mean, we're still talking about Pat Terrell and Dewan Francisco and guys like that, right? Yeah. You know, uh, and you go to Georgia and you become Lewis Seen, who's a good football player, first-round pick, but is anybody in Georgia going to be talking about him in five years? No. And that's just the nature of it. Same thing with Alabama. Half the people I know couldn't even tell you who Alabama starting safeties are. And they're good players. Yeah. You know, but it's just like you're the next in line. Yeah. And that's what Notre Dame can sell right now. And, and man, he's really good after the catch, man. And oh, honestly, he's so good. He, he brings he's a lot so to the good. table. Just to go to your Georgia point, mm-hmm. we actually talked to Wes Pritchett, middle linebacker from the 1988 National Championship team, who has been very candid over the last few months that he wanted to go to Georgia. He's mm-hmm. from Atlanta, Georgia. He wanted to go to Georgia. He had just gotten back from a trip up to Athens, and he came home. And the very next week when it was time to make his decision, his dad flat out told him he was going to Notre Dame. <laughs> like, you're, you're going to Notre Dame. Thanks, Pops. Right? And he said it finally hit him three years into his professional career as a member of the Atlanta Falcons. I don't have to go through this. I got a broken hand. Yeah. I got a dislocated shoulder. All of my friends from school are working on Wall Street, making more than me. Mm-hmm. He said it was an easy decision. Like, I'm done. He said, I went to Wall Street and I've made a ton of money. And we let him know that there were a couple of Georgia kids, Georgia natives, that were still trying to decide whether or not they wanted to come to Notre Dame. He said, who are they? Tell me. <laughs> and we were like, whoa. Wait a minute. Like, and he was like, tell me. Give me their names. Right. It was almost like he was like, oh, I'll let them know. Right. He was like, because to be honest, no one cares. He said, no one cares about your Georgia degree right. outside of the state of Georgia. Right. And that right there, you know, just goes a long way. If you can get these kids to understand. Alabama's the same way too, Sean. Yeah. Like did you right. just pointed out, like you're going to stand out more right. as a great player on the field at Notre Dame. And once you leave the game, you're going to stand out even more. Right. With this degree. That's why so many famous people send their kids to Notre Dame. Yeah. I mean, at one point in time, I recently, I mean, I'm walking around and I'm like, okay, I just walked past Tory Hunter, David Robinson, and John Bon Jovi. <laughs> On the sideline. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, because all yeah. their kids are at Notre Dame. Yeah. You know, and, and it's just, it's a different animal, right? I mean, and that's why you see so many former NFL professional athletes sending their kids in their name because they understand what you understand sean like yeah like west purchase said like i don't need this now it, it, the money's a little different now than it was in you know 1992 or yeah. whenever when he retired but still yeah. it's the same principle same right principle. because the yeah. kids don't leave another name or are making even more money too with their degrees so but but to have that shot though you still have to be able to present at the end of the day you still have to be able to present a a football option for these kids and that's going to be the key and Absolutely. so that's where that's where the pressure in june is on sean yeah. and the other part the other challenging part of this too is because the recruiting cycle has been sped up so much you have 23 24 and 25 kids all coming on campus this summer right and so you also have to to, to measure your you've got chances to make impressions on 24 kids that are going to be on campus this summer too which only adds to the the burden of what the summer has become. And, and, and so it's a big month because now for a 24 kid, you don't want to make sure if a kid comes on campus, maybe 
and, and they're smart. They're not bringing a ton of 24 kids on the official visit weekends. Right. There will there'll probably be some. But, you know, when these kids do come on campus, you, you have to make sure that you're not not giving them enough attention to where yeah. then now you're playing behind the yeah. rest of the way. Yeah. Which we have to point out, Young is coming in all by himself. Right. Which is important. Number one running back, yeah. middle of the week, all by himself. He's another one, Sean. This is your chance. This, this is your chance. You you got a shot from the 13th to the 15th. That's your shot. If you don't, yeah. if you don't, you know, hit a grand slam, walk off bottom of the ninth, game seven, World Series home run, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're not gonna get him. Yeah. But you're gonna get your chance. And I'm a lot more confident now than I've ever than I've been in a very long time about the ability of this Notre Dame coaching staff to actually hit that. Like this is the kind of like I, you remember when Jock Patrick visited a number of years ago for Irish yeah. Invasion, like when it first wow, started. That's the name. Yeah. And and people are like, oh, they might. I'm like, guys, I'm not getting Jock Patrick. Come on, man. And he ended up in Florida State, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And there was another big time running back in that class that visited that summer. And I was like, guys, come on. <laughs> like, relax. You know, they're not getting that guy. And you know, this one is one of those ones where it's like, you know what? Like, I don't think they're gonna get him, but I'm not. I'm not uh like I'm not said. writing that off. I'm not dismissing this staff. I'm not yeah. I'm not gonna just say to oh, Dylan McCall is not getting that guy. Yeah. You know, like yeah. oh Tommy Reese can't get that guy. Ah, yeah. you know, so uh, I'm not gonna put anything past the staff now. Yeah. I had there was a quote from I think it was a quote from Ryan that he got. No, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that. I'm trying to remember who it was, Sean. Maybe you gave it to me. This is the bad thing about having such a big staff now. Is I'm trying to remember who told me stuff. Somebody told me that he was told by, I think it was Jaden Lamar, or maybe I read it. Maybe somebody else tweeted it. I can't remember where I heard it. So if it wasn't from one of my guys, it was from another source. I, I'm not purposely giving credit to my staff, but it was something along the lines of Jaden Lamar said he talked to Marcus Freeman. I think this might have been actually from another site tweeted it out. Okay. Now that I think about it, but he said he talked to Marcus Freeman more than he talked to any other position coach that was recruiting him. If that's true of Jaden Lamar, yeah. What what do you think the conversations are like with Richard Young? Yeah. You know what I mean, and Jason yeah. Moore and Jaden yeah. Osbury. So yeah. I'm I'm excited to see what they can do. I think it's a group that's got a chance to be a great class, but if they can just get a couple kids, here's the thing, Sean, last part of this, you talked about momentum. Yeah. If they can somehow get one or two kids from the June 10th to 12th visit weekend. So I, the, the potential guys are like that I'm looking at is like Ronan Hannafin, right? He would be one on my list. Jason Moore, Jaden Osbury, or Christian Gray. One of one to two of those four kids get one to publicly commit. And if, if one other can at least silently commit. So like, let's just say hypothetically, again, total hypothetical. I'm not dropping a hint that really is going to happen, but you know, the total hypothetical, right? Let's just say Christian gray wanted to commit, but still wants to honor the July 4th decision date. That would still have an impact if they can get at least two guys from that weekend to, to commit. So what was did I say? Ronan Hannafin, Jason Moore, Jaden Osbury, Christian Gray, just one to two of those four guys to commit, then, then I feel that 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 would give Notre Dame a chance to 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 get some momentum going to kind of close out. Yeah. That would be that would be the key for me. And something else I wrote down, patience. Yeah, I know where that's coming from. Patience, right? Um yes. And I say this not only because of the coach, I think just the fan base in general, like we're having to learn patience. You talked about this coaching staff is different and they're taking recruiting at Notre Dame into a totally different realm mm -hmm. that most of us haven't been used to under the previous regime. They have to learn how to be patient. We as a fan base have to learn how to be patient because you're going to have a Monroe Freeland. Who is right. who wants to take him to the fall? You're gonna have a Samuel and Pimba who's supposed to come into June. But as a staff, you recognize, you know what? He's taking us into the fall. Let's go ahead and use this official for the Clemson game rather than now, because it's more beneficial to do it then 
than to do it now. So patience is going to be key. I actually spoke with a couple of days ago, and I'm sure a story will probably be going up in the next day or so. But I I didn't have time to put it on the message board before we did the show. But I spoke to Charles Jagasaw. And the more he gets into the process, Brian, remember we talked about this, like what he's saying all the right things. It seems like a Notre Dame fit, seems like a Notre Dame kid. Like, why is he talking about being patient and, and dragging this thing possibly into the season? And then all of a sudden he goes through his April visits and he's like, OK, probably August before the start of my season. And I talked to him a, like a couple of days ago, like, yo, you're a week out from starting the process of these visits with your mom, like where are you sitting? And all of a sudden he's like, man, I'm excited. I can't wait to get through the visits with my mom and see what she thinks. And, you know, man, I look hopefully to have a decision at the end of the month of where I'm going to go. And I'm like, whoa, how do we get to here? Like we've gone from fall, August, and now you've embraced the process so much and you're enjoying yourself so much that you're becoming even more sure of what you want to do. And now possibly we might see a decision shortly after your visits in June. So that's the way this thing, this recruiting thing works, man. These right. kids, you know, they'll tell you one thing and then they love a part of the process and they become even more sure of where they want to go. And the next mm -hmm. thing you know, yo, I'll have an announcement date. So this, this is how it goes, and this is where the patience comes into play. You know, yep. learning that, knowing that, seeing what each kid needs individually, and then making the move. Like you said, with the wide receivers, they had already been talking to Christian Hamilton, but on top of that, you know, when the whole Rodney Gallagher thing was going on, they said, you know what, we're going to turn up the fire even more right. on Christian Hamilton right. and get him on campus because we're not about to just put all of our eggs in this basket. Right. It is Rodney Gallagher. And, you know, just I talked to Coach Wilson, you know, Christian Hamilton. He said and Coach Wilson is coached for over 20 years. He said he's the greatest football player he's ever coached mm -hmm. in 20 years. So this is once again, fans, this is not a panic move. Oh, we're not getting this guy. Didn't get that guy. It's not recruiting is supposed to go. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Alabama wanted Arch Manning. They didn't get him. Yes. They quickly turned to Eli Holstein and got him. Got him. Yeah. You know what I mean, like. I just, Sean, I I think we've kind of we've kind of done a nice job of putting the bow on on what's at stake in June and July. I I, I got to respond to what you and I have both been responding to in the chat. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. About go this ahead. secondary recruiting. Look, there's yeah. there's one thing that we that we'll both acknowledge. Yes, Notre Dame has to do a better job continuing to improve cornerback recruiting. However, if all you're going to do is list off recruiting rankings, you're not doing this argument correct. Because yeah. somebody like like we don't somebody said we don't have a single top two fifty recruited cornerback. Cam Hart's one of the ten best cornerbacks returning in college football. He was in the six hundred as a recruit. So I rank him the top one fifty. Yeah. So who was right or wrong here? You know what I mean? Like Notre Dame beat Alabama and Washington. Washington, who has produced as many DBs in the last five years as any team in the country outside of maybe Bama and Ohio State and LSU, maybe. Yeah. Wanted Benjamin Morrison bad. Alabama wanted Benjamin Morrison hard, and Notre Dame got him. But there's no excitement about Benjamin Morrison with some people. Why? Because his recruiting rankings. There are far too many people who put emphasis on what rivals 247 and now on three say and not yeah. enough on what people who actually do this for a living and whose jobs depend on. If you rank a kid high and he doesn't pan out, you don't get fired. If you recruit kids and they don't pan out, you get fired as a coach, right? Like this is the problem with this is are the rankings accurate sometimes? Sure. Are they inaccurate sometimes? Absolutely. But when you're making, when you're like, like, for example, I, I love Devin Moore, you know that. And just cause he went to Florida doesn't change my opinion. I love Devin Moore. He was a top 100 caliber player, mm -hmm. but the whole time that he was committed to Notre Dame, I ranked Benjamin Morrison higher than him. I guarantee you, this is a hundred percent certainty. Notre Dame, as a corner, as a pure corner, ranked J Benjamin Morrison ahead of Devin Moore. Absolutely. Yet because Devin Moore jumped into the top 100 of the recruiting rankings, people view that Notre Dame lost their best corner commit. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. 
their best corner commit shows up tomorrow or set tomorrow to Notre Dame. His name's yeah. Benjamin Morrison, right? And so there's does Notre Dame need to improve its secondary recruiting? Yes. But what we're not doing enough of is acknowledging that that's already started. It started in 2021 when Mike Mickens went out and got Benjamin Morrison, I mean, got uh, Ryan Barnes, Philip Riley, Chance Tucker, another kid that he they beat Washington for. Mm-hmm. In a year where Notre Dame couldn't, his first whole year recruiting, he couldn't go on the road and recruit. Right. And then last year, he got two four-star cornerbacks, two top players, in my opinion, with impressive offer lists in his second cycle that's already begun yeah notre dame beat clemson and georgia for brian barnes clemson wanted him and georgia was really had offered him and was turning up the heat notre dame got him but notre dame a lot and too many notre dame fans don't think he's a big time player why because he's a three-star right right and that's the problem so yes we can acknowledge that notre dame needs to up their recruiting in the secondary yeah but not enough people are acknowledging that they've already started to do that and if you're going to sit there and tell me we don't have a single top 250 cornerback on our roster outside of outside of uh, Jaden Mickey, that says a lot of more a lot more about the recruiting services than it does about Notre Dame's talent at cornerback. Because Cam Hart, if Cam Hart wasn't a top 250 recruit coming out of high school, then I need to find something else to do with my life. Can I ask and, you a question? And, and I've been proven to be right about him because look at him; he's one of the best cornerbacks in the country. Yeah, coming back, this, and that's not just my opinion. Lindy's Magazine, right here. They have Cam Hart ranked 10th in the nation at cornerback coming back. Only one cornerback on Notre Dame's entire schedule is ranked ahead of him, and it's a kid number at number nine at Stanford. That's it. And, and so, you know, at some point in time, you've got to look at recruiting rankings as a, as a just a part of the discussion and not looking at it as the end-all, be-all, or top of the decision-maker of identifying a kid's talent. If you are looking at at, re- at evaluating Notre Dame's roster, and the first thing you go to is recruiting rankings, you're not doing it right. No. Now, can recruiting rankings be a part of the conversation? Yes, they should be. That's Otherwise, why would I do them? I'd be the biggest idiot in the world to say that recruiting rankings don't have some value when I do them. But you've got to put them in the proper context. You have to. And once a kid go- gets on campus and shows something one way or the other, then, you know, the <laughs> Then you have you have to kind of throw it out. I mean, you know, and and so a and, lot of it know, is, you know, like I said, you know, I see I see the chat, and you know, I don't, you know, people are saying they don't think he's as good as a player. You don't have to, you don't have to believe us. It's the offenses that don't throw at him. Don't believe us. Yeah. Every offense they faced last year went the other way. Yeah. And didn't want to change well, after the, the Wisconsin team, game. The yeah. only team that dared to throw with their number one receiver got picked off twice. Twice. And that was right. Wisconsin. Right. So, look, you don't have to believe us. You don't have to believe recruiting rankings. This is the question I have to ask you. The number four overall pick in the NFL draft, who recruited him? Who recruited him, Mike Brian? Mickens. Who, who recruited him? Mike Mickens. Oh, what was he ranked? Oh, the in the time? 1600s. 1600s? Okay. Mm-hmm. So, is mm-hmm. it more about rankings or development? It's about rankings, Sean. You can't coach a guy up who's ranked outside of the top two. That, that same awesome. coach that's our defensive back coach got that kid ready to play as a true freshman, right? right? And now he's the number four overall pick in the NFL draft. Right. But he was ranked as the 163rd cornerback in the nation right. and the 1600th prospect in the nation right? coming out of high school. But he's number four overall pick based upon the guy that's our defensive back coach that watched film and said you know right. this kid's special so that's that's all i'm saying that's all yeah. i'm saying and i've watched Jaden mickey enough this spring to be able to say that's a special kid that's going to be at notre dame for the next yeah. three years so i don't i don't know how much you can put on him when he's in the infancy <laughs> as a position coach and recruiting wise at notre dame I, I don't know. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some some numbers, Sean. I'm gonna give you some numbers. Okay. In 2021, there's this kid named Julian Love. Remember him? In 2018, I mean. Remember, yeah. remember, remember that kid, Julian Love? Yeah. I'm not sure if you yeah. remember him. He was a three-year starter. Mm-hmm. Uh 2017, he was ranked in the top five in 
pass defense, passes defense. That's interceptions plus breakups. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, he was a consensus All-American, correct? Yeah. As a sophomore, the year in which he finished top five in passes defense, he gave up 36 completions for 423 yards. As a junior, a consensus All-American season. Yeah. He gave up, and this is with Troy Proud on the other side. He gave up 42 completions for 53.2, or excuse me, for 413 yards. He allowed 43.2% completion percentage against him. 50.7 first career. Yeah. Okay, so 423 yards allowed in 2017, 413 yards allowed in 2018. Mm -hmm. Gave up an average of 39 catches a year. Yeah. Completion percentage first career, 50.7. It was 53.2 as, as a junior when I was All-American. Cam Hart last year. His first year as a starter, two <laughs> years after moving from receiver. Gave up 32 completions. 335 yards. So he was, say, 78 yards fewer than Julian Love. Yeah. And 10 catches fewer than Julian Love the year that Julian Love was a consensus All-American. So, I mean, you know, other other than your perception or being obsessed with his recruiting ranking, there's yeah. nothing about you, nothing about him, how his perception. I mean, so it's like you got to say everyone else in the country is wrong about Cam Hart except for me. Um. You know, so I mean that just that just doesn't that doesn't fly. That doesn't fly. So you know, you can continue to think that he's not a good player, but the fact of the matter is, is Cam Hart is way better than recruiting rankings thought, which is what I said at the time. Yeah, you know, and uh, he's proven that to be true. So, but that also doesn't mean that Notre Dame is perfectly content there. That there are there were recruiting issues from before, which is why Clarence Lewis had to play sooner than Absolutely. he did. Absolutely. There's no question. And so we need to be able to say one of two things. Number one is, yes, Notre Dame does need to recruit better in the secondary. There are question marks opposite Cam Hart. There are. We have said them many times. Yeah. But if you can't at least acknowledge certain things, then we're not really having a, 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 a objective an, conversation. A, we're not. We're yeah. not. We need to be able to say, like, for example, safety. Notre Dame's safety position is going to be pretty good this year because they got a transfer from Northwestern. If they don't get that transfer from Northwestern, we're a lot more concerned about the safety position. It's yeah. got to get better. Right. Development and recruiting. We, we, we can have that honest conversation. We can say cornerback recruiting's got to get better. But you also then need to be able to say, but it's getting better. It's already gotten better. There's talent there. And – People recruiting rankings were wrong about this kid over here who teams won't throw at and who has been excellent this the last two years. I mean, it's like Stanford, and, and here's here's some funny stats for you. So Stanford completed four passes on Cam Hart for a total of seven yards. Do you know why? Because they count throws that were like two-yard catches against off coverage they count as a completion against him. Right. So um, – yeah. So anyway, that I want to, I just want to wrap it up with that conversation because I saw what was going on in the chat and I was like, um, we're allowed to have differences of opinion here, but <laughs> if you can't at least acknowledge that part of it, then we're not having an objective conversation. I mean, you know, my, my problem is we're talking about replacing people that haven't even had time right. to really build on what was a bare cover when they came right. in. And you can't say that he can't recruit. When he just had two defensive right. backs taken, right, that he recruited to his at his previous spot and developed, they were on the field right. early. Like that's why Jaden Mickey is being talked about getting run early in the season because of the, the development that's taking place. And the thing we have to remember about last year's freshman class, for example, Ryan Barnes, who was the top corner in that group, Notre Dame felt he was their top cornerback commit. He missed yeah. his whole senior year because of COVID. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, to me, those are the things you have to look at, right? Uh, you know, I – you know, 
talk recruiting and then say, I don't want to talk about development. Right. That's, that's the whole point. Why do you think Nick Saban coaches the defensive backs? Yes, right. he goes and gets the best defensive backs, right. but they still come in needing coaching. His like, first title was, team had a corner, two cornerbacks who were three-star recruits. Javier absolutely. Arenas and Kareem Jacks were both three-star recruits. Three-star recruits. And they've I been getting the four and five for, stars. Wouldn't you say they've been getting four and five stars the last three years? Sure. And the biggest – Their secondary has been mediocre. Been awful or mediocre. And that included having a stud like Patrick Sertan on their yes, quarterback list. Absolutely. So what? Once again, stars, rating systems, and, and we're not saying they're there yet. No one's saying that. No one is saying no, 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 no. Notre Dame's going to win a title this year because of their secondary. No one's yep. saying that. It, 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 but at the same time, you also have to be willing to admit that a, it's gotten better, right? And b, some of the guys were misevaluated by not by Notre Dame, but by the National Recruiting Services. I mean, and if you can't at least admit some of that, then. Like if your only view of great recruiting Notre Dame equals recruiting ranking here, yeah. then did you think that Jeremiah Wusu Kormo was a bad pickup? <laughs> did you think Isaiah Foskey was a bad pickup? He wasn't a top 200 recruit. No. Right. I mean, so that's the kind of, that's the thing you got to go down is like, look, you, you, you have to be able to put recruiting rankings in the proper context. And, and cause here's the other thing. When a kid develops, it doesn't always mean they were wrong. Kids develop differently. Kids develop at different times. I had no problem with anybody that ranked Joe Wald as a three-star last year. None. Not not a one. I had him as a three-and-a-half-star kid. But you looked at him and said, boy, this is a kid with a lot of ceiling, though, right? But he's got, you know, we got to see if he can make the transition, blah, 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 which is why I gave him a four-and-a-half-star upside grade. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when you look at Joe Wald now, it's like, did they get hit? Did they get it wrong? Or was it just a, well, this is a kid that's still developing. Yeah. And he's developing at a different age than Blake Fisher, who was a monster as a freshman in high school, right? I mean, that's part of it. They don't always get it wrong, but kids develop at different ages. You know, like I was talking to to to, to Coach Mickens at one point in time, and I asked him, like, did you guys think that that Sauce Gardner was going to be the player he was? He goes, no, no, we we loved him coming out of high school. We didn't view him as a kid that thought was going to be a first-round NFL draft pick. But we knew pretty early on that he was going to be that guy, that yeah. he had a chance to be that guy. So it's it's about I mean because he was like a, I think he was like 145 pounds when he enrolled as a true freshman. Yeah, guys, and so it's not always like every time a guy develops, the recruiting services aren't wrong. It's just sometimes it's like kids develop differently. It's and sometimes they're wrong. they were flat out wrong about Cam Hart, and I said so at the time. They were wrong about Jeremiah Wusukormo, who I had as a four star player with four yeah. and a half star upside. I actually didn't give him enough of a upside grade. I should have given him an even higher upside grade. They're 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 wrong sometimes, you know. So. But sometimes kids develop differently. And and so you can't – if we're if we're having a real conversation about winning a national title, you can't have a conversation about recruiting without development. It's a useless can't. conversation. You can't. It, it is. It is. But the coach is watching the tape saying, this kid is going to be this in two years. Right. right. Like no one wants to say, I need this kid on right. the field next year. They didn't recruit Ryan Barnes to say, we think he's going to start. It, he was a kid that they always thought was going to need some time, yes. but they loved his talent. And then when you factor in the fact that he missed the senior year because of COVID, it adds to it. So right. let's let these kids get a little bit of time at Notre Dame first before we just assume that they weren't good players because of their recruiting ranking. That's all we're saying. Okay. So, Sean, I do think this is a nice segue into our second topic of conversation mm -hmm. and that is what does Notre Dame need to do to actually become that dynasty program that that we think that they can be because they're not there yet and I would argue that Notre Dame can put has a chance to compete for and win a title the next two years I truly believe that but doing so won't mean that they've arrived as a dynasty it won't just like LSU was, isn't a dynasty. They won yeah. a title in 19. Yeah. They're not a dynasty. Florida State won a title in 13. That was a phenomenal team. The next year they went out, went 13-0, and but they were an overrated team and got destroyed in the playoff. They weren't great in 2012. Mm -hmm. They weren't great in 2011. They were good. And then after 2015, they started to really go down. They had one great team. One pretty decent team that got embarrassed, and then a bunch of okay to bad teams. That's not a dynasty. So 
what does Notre Dame need to do to, to be that? And let's define dynasty. So over the next, say, seven to eight to ten years, Notre Dame wins at least one national title and is a team that every year is competing for another chance at it. So if we go like over an eight-year period, mm -hmm. you're in the playoff at least half of those times and you win at least one championship. Again, we're talking minimum, right? So you know, Clemson, what they've done since 2015. Playoff appearances in all but what one year, right? Two national titles. Obviously, Alabama's there. You look at what Miami was in the 80s. And, and I would argue that Notre Dame's 88 to 93 run was a mini dynasty time. M mini, right? Because they only had one title. I think they got screwed out of a second title. It's a different conversation for another day. But the, yeah. but at least half of those years, Notre Dame was a team that you looked at and said, they at least deserved a shot at a national championship or, or were as every bit as good or could have, whatever the case may be. Right. And so to me, what do they have to do to at least at the minimum, minimum get back to what they were in 88 to 93? Those That's kind of the premise that we're working with. The, the dynasty standard isn't what Alabama's done the last 12 years. That's unique. That's unicorn stuff. That's like, that's like, that's like saying, well, Bama wasn't a dynasty because they didn't go over through a four year period without losing a single game like Notre Dame did during that four year period under Frank Leahy. Four mm -hmm. years, three titles, zero losses. That's not the standard for dynasty because it's, it, you can't ask people to live up to that. Otherwise, right. there's never going to be another dynasty, right? So, you know, so Bama's, Bama's kind of like at the high end of what a dynasty looks like. Right. Then there's like the Clemson level. And, and then I think that the only other team that deserves to be in the conversation over the last decade would be Ohio State. Right. Won a title, has played in the title game twice, has made the playoff at least half the times during that stretch. Right. And they've been 10 plus wins every year. I think they're more debatable, but because they won a title in this, you know, last decade of of excellence, and their worst year was what, like eleven and two? Yeah. It's been their worst year. I think they're in the conversation. And to me, that's it. That's the conversation. Oklahoma to me is not that, even though they've been a playoff team and all this, you gotta win one. You can't be a dynasty without a title. No. And a title doesn't mean you're a dynasty, as we established with LSU and teams like that. So, Sean, and Georgia's not there yet either. Yeah. The, Georgia needs an, a, just a couple more years of, you know, more playoff appearances because they're not even the best team in their league, right? And, and it's hard for me to accept that you're a dynasty when you're not even the best team in your league. And then the year you won a title, you also got blasted by that same team early in the year when that team was still healthy. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Yeah. So when you look at Notre Dame, I, I think the first step has been taken. You have to have a – and we're going to talk about the head coach now, Sean. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is we're going to compartmentalize the head coach right now because you and I agree that you can't say that hiring Marcus Freeman was the step to a dynasty in every capacity of what a head coach has to do because we don't know the answer to that yet. Right. I think in one as one very important aspect for Notre Dame especially, the head football coach has to be a dynamic recruiter or have a dynamic recruiting operation. I think he has to be a dynamic recruiter. I don't it, because Lou Holtz was a dynamic recruiter. He just did it differently than Coach Freeman because it was a different era. Lou could start recruiting in December. Because that's when recruiting really took off. Right. So Vinny Serrato would do all this work. You know, that's who Chad Bowden is now. Would do all this work. Staff would do all this work. And then they'd get the kids on campus in December and January. And they'd close for February. Right. That's how recruiting worked then. Yeah. And so Lou would come in and he would deliver the speeches. And number one class, number one class, number one class. Like back to back to back to back to back. Right. And so. And so. I think when when somebody asked, do I consider USC a dynasty during the 2000s, a mini one, a, a similar to like the Notre Dame stretch, because it was such a short period of time where they were truly yeah. elite dominant, but they did win a couple titles. So, yes, I do consider them a – If you got to be at least a half a decade. They are a Vince Young scramble away from being a true dynasty. Even more – they're they're a Vince Young scramble away from being borderline Miami 80s, 90s. Yeah. Because that had been their third title. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yes. Yes. 
and they were never the same after that. No, they were never the same after that. So that's why I say many for like a five year stretch. USC was the premier team in the country. Absolutely. So they're, they're they're similar to what Notre Dame was from 88 to 93. Like that's the, to me, those two teams are the minimum for what a dynasty has to be. You either have to have multiple titles or, you know, number one, two finishes over a short period of time or, you know, success over a longer period of time. Yeah. So back to the conversation. So I think from a recruiting standpoint, Notre Dame has a head coach in place, Sean, that is a dynamic recruiter. And I think in today's era with recruiting be year round, it's hard for me to think Notre Dame can have the talent to consistently be a top five team. Facts. Right. Yeah. And so like Florida state to me was a dynasty in the nineties, right? They weren't a great team, after, but they were just top five every year. Every year. Even if you take away the 93 title and say, Notre Dame should have got that. They still won one in 99, yeah. but they were a top five team every single year. Yep. And they were two missed kicks against Miami away from having another title, right? So I mean, they were like that's that's the thing is that's the 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 bar. I think Notre Dame has the first step is talent acquisition. At the end of the day, is still going to be the most important thing for Notre Dame, right? It's got to start there. And I think with Marcus Freeman and his ability to recruit and the emphasis he puts on hiring good recruiters, it's got to be those two things is the first big step. The Notre Dame has because I want to talk first, Sean, about the things we think that are in place already mm-hmm. for Notre Dame to be there, and then what they need to do next. So I think that's the first thing that they have already taken that step. Marcus Freeman is a dynamic recruiter who understands the importance of hiring a dynamic recruiting staff. Is the first huge step towards Notre Dame becoming that that program moving forward. And I'll add on to that. He's charismatic. And he's a fantastic deliverer, deliverer of the message of the school on and off the field, not mm-hmm. only to recruits, but alumni, former players, and the fan base. That sounds like Lou Holtz. He has galvanized everything that is Notre Dame. And that is something that you have to be very special to be able to come to Notre Dame, which is a different place than any other college football campus or program. And to be able to bring all facets of the university and the program together and raise the level of excitement. He's done that. But not only that, you told me something that made so much sense this past week when you talked about his relationship that he has with Lou Holtz. Mm-hmm. We already know he has a great relationship with his mentor, Jim Tressel, who won a national championship at Ohio State. But now you add into the wisdom of Lou Holtz and how to handle the position of head coach at Notre Dame, not just from a recruiting standpoint, but when you come before people and the alumni, you talk about things and you're going before the fans and the students and there's so much wisdom he can gather from Lou Holtz and his mentor to go ahead and implement those things. We can just look at the way he put together his coaching staff, right? Mm-hmm. Like that was the first challenge, right? Okay. You have the job. You played the Fiesta Bowl. Didn't go the way you wanted it to go. Now you have to fill these vacancies on the coaching staff. And right now, most of us are very happy. With what we've seen from the coaching staff to this point, through spring practice, the way they've coached, the way they're recruiting, and then we get to see how they react when the bullets go live. Well, I don't even want to say that now. I'm sorry. That's a wrong, bad phrase to use, especially with some things that are happening currently in the United States. I apologize for that. But when, that, when the cracking starts with the helmets. On and the pads seven, start popping, baby. That's right. We'll see how this staff is going to come together and how they'll react to live action. And that's it. But we got the guy. You need a guy as the head coach. We got him. And last but not least, just like Lou Holtz, you have to have a perfect mixture of veterans and youngsters to have a great team, a championship team. And with that, they all have to buy in. Because you're going to have some kids that weren't recruited by him that were under the previous regime. You're going to have some that were brought in by him 
and are quote unquote his guys. And they he has to be able to get the message to the entire team and get them to buy in. They've done that. Like and we've talked it uh, talked about it at nauseum, you know, via the too phone. much, Sean. Too they've much. bought in too much. Because they're over 86 and they're not figuring out how to get under 85. <laughs> <laughs> too much, man. And it's just it's amazing to be at this point as a fan base coming from the disappointment of what took place when we found out the former head coach wasn't going to be here any longer. Going through that unknown of not having a coach and then coming to this position with this staff and this head coach, you have to be excited as a Notre Dame fan. There's no, There should be no other way to feel. Yeah, You shouldn't feel hesitant. You should be excited about where things are. Because of what we know. Yes. Now, here's where I would say we're going to kind of flip it to what needs to be proven. Okay. The fact of the matter is, is, is Marcus Freeman is only – his dynamic recruiting is only going to go so far if he can't prove that he's also a very good coach, right? And that's yeah. why I think this season is so important for Notre Dame because if he can go out and – you know, like even just some of the prognostications we're seeing – Number eight overall, yeah. you know, ten and two type of year. You know, yeah. like Lindy's has him playing Miami in the Orange Bowl. If you go ten and two and you lose to Ohio State and Clemson in close games, it's not great. But it's it, and then you win, beat Miami in the bowl game. Yeah, it may not be a great season from our standpoint. You know, you yeah. got to start beating those teams. But mm -hmm. from a perception standpoint on the recruiting trail, it's it's going to be huge for Notre Dame. Yeah, because it's like okay, they haven't fallen off now that he's taken over. Right. Because right. of the perception of who Brian Kelly is as a coach, if he can show that, hey, man, we're, we're still there. Right. But now, you know, the, that's where the recruit, you know, you can't have you can't go like nine and three or eight and four. You can't have that kind of step back. Yeah. And I think those are the things that I look at, Sean, and I say until and, you know, in order to because from a recruiting standpoint, you know, you have to start doing this over and over and over and over in order to really recruit at a high level. Like you can't just have this great 23 class and then not recruit like this in like 2022, the next six, seven years. Cause you may, cause then you turn into LSU, <laughs> you, you know, when this, when that group, when, when 22 are seniors and 23 are juniors, yeah, you know, the, the, this Notre Dame team could be special, right? But then they're all gone and you go back to being what LSU was. Right. And yeah. You know, or, or that that's that's the point. You have to be able to string these together. The one thing that I think that you always hear when it comes to you have to recruit at an elite level, the first response is what? You got to recruit top recruit. five classes. Right. That is such nonsense. Please stop. Please stop. Because if your evidence is Alabama, we've already said Alabama is a different animal. I'm going to read you Clemson's composite class rankings from 2011 to 2018, because can we all agree that those are the classes that made up their two title teams and their mm -hmm. run during that stretch? Yeah. Composite class rankings, 10, 20, 9, 16, 9, 11, 16, and 7. That's a grand total of zero top five classes. Now, the funny thing is, Sean – their worst team that they've had in since what 2014? Yeah. When Deshaun, and that's because Deshaun got hurt. The worst team that they had actually came, that'd be the 21 team, actually came after they had gotten back to back top five classes. Right. The only two top five classes Clemson landed were the 20 and 21 classes. So their roster now is made up of more top five classes than the two teams that won championships. What's the Two difference to nothing. between those rosters, Brian? They recruited great players, mm -hmm. but they cared more about guys that fit what they were trying to build. Guys that were bought in. Now, they got skill players. They had quarterbacks. They did all those type of things, right? Right. But it wasn't about go out and get highly ranked guys. That's why Clemson has two titles and Georgia and Ohio State both have one apiece. Speak right? On it. Yep. So that's the thing you have to understand is it's about building an elite roster. And so many people are obsessed with recruiting rankings because of Bama. Yeah. You got to stop. Bama's not, you're not going to be that. No one is going to be that. No, no. There is another way. Georgia is the only team that can come close. 
That's and, and they're even questionable. Let's see what they yeah. do now that they lost 15 guys in the NFL. Let's see if, you know, and, and, and Bama is going to be better. And so to me, this idea of, you know, top five recruiting classes every year, if that's the case, that's fine. I'm good with that. Right. right. But as I've said a million times, I care more about recruiting the right kind of players. And I'm talking about skill wise, building your roster, being complete, not like Texas A&M who had the number one class with like half their class played three positions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's not the way to do it. Right. The way to do it is figuring out what your strengths are, being great at those strengths, but then also recruit upping your recruiting at positions where you're not as strong. So, like, for example, back to James's conversation right earlier, we were talking about corner secondary recruiting. Secondary recruiting has got to get better. But Notre Dame does not need five star players at every position to win a championship. You know who you know, the only team in the country that's got five star players at every position. It's all it's it's whoever's still playing EA Sports 2014. Right. That's it. That's not that's, real life. And that's when you cheat and go in and change right. the attitude. That's right. <laughs> that's that's not real life. Right. You know, and, and so the the whole point for me is you've got to be able to get the right players. Now, this is not a shopping down a different aisle conversation. No. No. Because I think Notre Dame's capable of getting top five classes. But if Notre Dame has the number eight class in the country because they only sign 19 guys because they don't lose kids like other teams do, and they only sign 19 guys because that's all they had room for, guess what? That class is going to be ranked high. Yeah. Because do you know what the class was, the class ranking was for the class that had Trevor Lawrence? It was seventh. They had five five-star players in that class. But the problem is they only signed, like, was it like 17 kids, right? So sometimes you got to look at a ranking and say – that's not indicative of how good that class is. Now, do they need elite classes consistently? We just said they got to stack top classes on top of each other. Yeah. What I'm more saying is we've got to change in this chat. We've got to change the definition of what makes a top class. Because oh, Florida State and USC were putting top classes together for years and not winning in the way that Bama and Clemson have won. Right? I mean, USC has out-recruited Notre Dame. Clemson, in four of the five years, leading up to the 2015 matchup that Notre Dame lost in four of those five years. Yeah. Notre Dame had higher ranked recruiting classes in four of those five years. The only exception was the freshman class in 2015. That's the only year that Georgia, that Clemson had a higher ranked class in Notre Dame. That's it. That's it. But Clemson was a better program, right? Because their roster was built better, yeah. they had better depth, and they had better coaching. So to me – you do need to keep stacking top classes on top of each other, but we can't always define it by how it's ranked by the services for a million reasons that I don't really care to get into today. Otherwise, our show is going to go on forever. But we we should all agree that you have to stack top classes on top of each other every year. It's just we need to change the way that we define what a top class is and not just immediately go to, well, 247 said this. Because does anybody think the point? So I'm pointing out uh, Clemson's. Does anybody think that they actually never had a top five class? Does anyone look at their raw their, their, those classes and do you really want to argue me that they never had a top five class? The ranking said it. The ranking said they did have one, but you look at their 2018 class. It ranked seventh. Would you trade that? There are not six classes that I would have traded for that class. Yeah. They had Trevor Lawrence, Xavier Thomas, KJ Henry, Jackson Carmen, Darian Kendrick, Justin Ross. I mean, Mario Goodrich, Mike Jones, Darnell Jeffries. I mean, that, that class had some Jordan McFadden. That class had some dudes on it. Kyler McMichael. That class had some guys that were very key to that team being very good in 2018. Yeah. You know, the, the 2017 class, which ranked number 16th. Right, this, that's the class we always talk about. That's the one that helped them win the title. That's the guys that were sophomores in two thousand. Or I mean, um, uh, yeah, that guys that were sophomores. No, I'm sorry, the 2017 class. Excuse me, that was the one that ranked 16th. That class had a lot of dudes on it that were very key parts of them winning a title in 2018. It ranked 16th. Here's who they had in that class: T. Higgins, A.J. Terrell, Amari Rogers, Justin Foster, Travis Etienne. Balen Spencer Specter, who's been a pretty key part of it, but there's some pretty important dudes. Chase Bryce, they got in that yeah. class who they don't beat Clem, they don't beat Syracuse in 2018 if Chase Bryce isn't signed. But think about that: Travis Etienne, 
Judge, Justin Foster, Amar Rogers, A.J. Terrell, T. Higgins in that class. And it ranked 16th. Why? It's only signed 14 dudes because they had signed so many kids before. Yeah. Right? And so you just took in back-to-back years, you had classes that ranked 16th, 7th, and 11th because the 2016 class ranked 11th. Right. So, I mean, do you, that class had Dexter Lawrence, Trey, Trey Lamar, Trayvon Mullen, Xavier Kelly, Cornell Powell, who was a, a, a got playing time for them. Sean Pollard started for them. Now it's Pinckney stepped in yeah. when uh, Dexter Williams got suspended for the playoff. Isaiah Simmons was in that class. Isaiah Simmons was a three star. F- FYI, James Skalski was in that class. Kayvon Wallace. That's a lot of starters on that Clemson team from 16 to 18. That the whole lineup almost was was from Tremaine Ankrum. I'm sorry, it was another starting offensive lineman. Those classes ranked 11th, 16th, and 7th. So the point is, it's not that Notre Dame can go out there and get genuinely the 11th, 16th, and 7th best classes. That's not the argument. The argument is that they weren't the 11th, 16th, and 7th best classes because of the flawed nature in which recruiting rankings are comprised. That's yeah. my point, Sean. Those were those were top five classes every year in my opinion, based on how you should be able to evaluate top classes, right? Yeah. But in a rankings-based system, that's the point, right? And and so that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. Yes, they got to stack up top classes. Yeah. The problem is not – the argument is not that that's wrong. The argument is we're not a, defining a top class – the, the right way because we're looking at the recruiting services as the definers of what makes a top class. And then they, once again, I, I want to reference, you know, a discussion I had with Wes Pritchett and I flat out asked him, I said, in 88, did you guys think that you were a championship team? He's like, no. No, Lou had been there two years. His record was 13 and 10. Like, we didn't know we are a championship team. He was like, we beat Michigan. We felt good after we beat them and said, okay, we're a good team. He said, then we beat Miami and no one else had a chance. Mm -hmm. At that point, no one else had a chance because we knew we believed. But these are the same players, Brian. Half of this team got embarrassed by Miami two years prior. Well, the year prior. The year prior, yes. They lost 24 nothing, I think, the year before. The year before. And then before that, that, in Jerry Faust's last game on national TV, they were crushed. Right. So when we talk about recruiting, yes, you need to recruit, but you also need the guy that can get the message across and can develop what's there. Right. It's not like you're about to bring in 80 new kids that are freshmen that are five stars. You have to be able to teach and develop everyone in that room. Right. Yeah. Let's look at Clemson. They didn't have the defensive lineman that they had in 2018 when they won the first national championship, but you know what they had? They had a difference maker at quarterback. That's right. That's the next step. Oh, wait. Oh, yep. yes. They had a wide receiver like Mike Williams. That was a four-star slash five-star. But you know who else they had that was the most important cog on third downs? Hunter Renfro, Walk a on. 5'11 kid from Las Vegas that was about 170 pounds when he arrived at Clemson. That might have been ranked in the top 1,500. Maybe. Mm, he, yeah, I'm going to look that up. Maybe. It's like, dude, teams are comprised Sean, of he, – he didn't even have a ranking. He didn't have a ranking. Didn't even. That means he was outside the top 2,000. But he was Deshaun Watson's favorite receiver. Right. And he meant just when it as mattered. much as that four and five star. Right. Did Alabama win before they became a great team when they beat Texas? That wasn't a great roster at that point. Those were players that had been there under the previous coach, and Nick Saban came in and gave them something to believe in, and they executed it. Greg McElroy wasn't a five-star quarterback, but they won. And then eventually, Mm -hmm. as Saban got in there, he started stacking classes and built the dynasty. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need a roster full of four and five stars to win a national championship, especially if you have a guy at quarterback, a difference maker, you get a guy at wide receiver that can be a dog, get some other players to play their role, 
Clemson's never had a dominant offensive line, Brian. Mm -mm. We talked about this constantly. I don't even think Dabo worries about getting a dominant offensive line. The only difference between Clemson the last two, three years and what they had previously is that DJ Uagalele is not the same guy that they thought he was. Because if he was, if he was like Trevor Lawrence, they would have been in the national championship last year. Mm -hmm. But he's not. They have the same talent on defense. They have the same offensive line they had, and they have a def uh, uh, they have a difference maker at running back, which is right. what they always had. Right. The same formula. They th it's the same formula to win. So let's let's dive into some some other things that are important from a from a football program standpoint, and then at the end we'll talk school because I think the school has to play its role as well. Mm -hmm. So we talked about Marcus Freeman has to prove that he is that coach. To your point, Lou Holtz wasn't just a great closer as a recruiter. That would have only taken them so far. Yeah. He also had to prove he was a great coach. We can't really discuss that because we don't know. We both yeah. think Marcus Freeman will be that guy. Will it be in 2022? Will he need a year to kind of get his feet wet and then become that guy in 23, 24, 25? That remains to be seen. We're going to have yeah. to see him, right? So yeah. we that would be a whole different show where we would just talk about what do we think he will or won't be. We've already had those shows. Actually, we talked about, we think he, we did a show, you and I, we think he will win at Notre Dame. Right. We express those reasons why, but until then it's all conjecture, right? right? It's just, it's a, a me, it's emotion and feeling. It's not based on empirical data. So right. let's focus on the things that, that he can do to prove other aspects of being a great head coach. So we don't know what kind of, you know, motivator he'll be. I think we think he'll be a good one. We don't know if he'll be able to put together good. game plans and practice schedules and make yeah. the right in-game decisions and press the right buttons, all those things we got to find out, right? Right. But one thing he's going to have to do that we know he's at least on the first uh, attempt is done well, he's got to put together great coaching staffs. The one thing that Lou did, the, here, here's the biggest difference between Notre Dame from like 88 to 90 and Notre Dame from like 94 to 97. Even 93, I would argue that if they had a better defensive coordinator, then it would be they would have they would have beat Boston College. I don't yeah. think Rick, I don't think that was a great hire. Rick Minner had success because he had great players. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Lou's staffs in the second half of his tenure were not as good as his early staffs. He didn't replace guys that were great that left with equal ability. Right. Here's the reality. If if Marcus Freeman is that coach on the field and Notre Dame has success in is a 10 plus win team the next two, three years, makes a playoff appearance. And even if they win a title, because again, yeah. a title does not make you a dynasty. No. He's gonna lose a lot of this current staff is gonna be gone. Let's just be honest about that. Like, yeah, there's like one coach that I can see being at Notre Dame for the next 10 years of age permits. And that's Harry. That's it. That's it. Like, and even him, I don't see like, I mean, he's 60 years, one years old. Right. But he, like, he's, he's definitely grooming his, his replacement correct. right now. But like Al Washington, if Notre Dame has Al Washington be a head coach someday, Dylan McCollins be a head coach someday, mm -hmm. you know, Jared Parker's going to have an OC job. Tommy Reese may be a head coach someday, you know, like, Mike Mickens is going to get that chance to be, you know, to be that guy. Chris O'Leary is going to, someone's going to hire him as a defensive coordinator if Notre Dame has success. That's what happens with great program. I mean, Al Alabama has lost so, I can't, I don't know if they've ever gone more than two years with the same staff. Yeah. Or even close yeah. to the same staff. Yeah. That's going to happen. So the key for Coach Freeman is he's got to show that he can replace great coaches who leave the right way, in the right way, meaning you're not firing a guy. Like it, meaning, like when you have a guy that that does the job, like if a guy's not doing the job and you fire him and replace him with somebody better, that's part of it. But that's not why you're winning because you shouldn't have hired a bad guy to begin with. Right. It's more about when you lose a great coach. If you go out and win the title in 23, and or let, let's just say hypothetically they win the title this year, mm -hmm. Tom Maurice is gone. I mean, he, he's probably gonna be head coach somewhere. Yeah, Al Washington's probably gonna be head coach somewhere. Right, like you're gonna lose guys like that because yeah. you just want a title. That's just the way that it goes. People overrate, you know, circumstances, or they want to tap into not overrate also, but tap into the great players. Right? You're gonna point is you're gonna lose some dudes. Okay, that's just the that's the way it goes. You're not gonna win a title and bring back 
all 10 of your coaches. Alabama or Georgia just lost dudes. Right. Right. I mean, they'd lost a dude to LSU. Right. You had another guy retire. You're going to lose coaches. Mm -hmm. And you replace them with equal quality of your, of your coaches. That's going to be a huge, huge piece for him to become a dynasty because, and, and then if, when, when you do make mistakes and he will, can you quickly recognize and replace that's the second part of putting together a great staff. Because you know who else has made bad hires in their career? Nick Saban. Ryan Day. Ryan Day, Dabo, Urban yeah. Meyer. Yeah. Right? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. Brian Kelly's not the only coach that made bad hires. Yeah. The issue I have with Brian Kelly was never that he shouldn't have hired Brian McGorder. I understand why he did it. I didn't like it at the time, but I get it. You've known him. He's been at SEC coordinator. He's been in the NFL. I understood the move. I just didn't like – I didn't think he was going to be – a great coordinator. I didn't think he was going to be as bad as he was. Right. But when you recognize that he's not that guy, then then make the move. Urban Meyer at one point in time thought that having Tim Beck and Ed Warner as co-coordinators was a smart decision. Right. It was not a smart decision. Right. I felt that at the time it was a bad decision. And he did it for a year. They went to the playoff. They out-talented people that year, Sean. That's a, that's a simple fact. That 2016 Ohio State team just simply had way better players than anybody else they played. Yeah. They didn't play a team with equal talent until they got to the playoff and they got beat 31 to nothing. Yeah. And you know what he did right after that? He fired them. Right? I mean, he did the same thing in 2013. The defense collapsed at the end of the year. They got whooped by Michigan State at the end of the year. And I mean, physically, they got whooped. The score yeah. wasn't a bluff. They physically got beat up by Michigan State. They'd had some games they won where they gave up a lot of points and then they could not stop Taj Boyd in the Orange Bowl at all. So what is Urban Meyer? They just went 12 and 2. 12 and 2. They were 12 and 0. They had won 24 straight games with Everett Withers as a defensive coordinator. So what did Urban Meyer do? He fired him and hired Chris Ash. What did they do the next year? Got better every single week on defense. And eventually that year they won a national championship. Won a national championship. Right. And and offense wasn't good enough. So what does he do? Goes out and hires Ryan Day. Hires Kevin Wilson. And and th- they get better. Yeah. Right. And and yeah. so to me, Sean, it's you're going to make mistakes as a head coach when, with your hires. It happens. It happens to everyone. Yeah. But can you then quickly recognize, fire, and then change? That's probably my biggest concern with Marcus Freeman because he is a decent person. He strikes me as someone who firing someone might be one of the harder things that he does. But it should be hard. It shouldn't be easy for you to tell another human being that you're fired and have no use for you. But it doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's kind of where I'm getting from. I see both sides of that coin with Marcus Freeman, right? I see how he interacts with his coaches and how the staff interacts with each other. And I can see it being difficult, but at the same time, knowing him, and hearing, listening to the players say, yo, yeah, you can say he's a player coach, but he has that side where he lets us know, hey, and he's all business. So I, I see him being able to compartmentalize when he needs to step up and operate like that and change things and move in another direction. And I see him being able to cause people to come in, feel comfortable and be successful mm-hmm. as a coach on his coaching staff. So I, I can see I can see both sides of that and why you might feel that way. For it's me, more of an unknown. Yeah, That's it is an thing. unknown. It's an it unknown. Is unknown. We don't know. Like I cuz 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 are you you're coming well, from let me let me we, ask you this question to clarify. Yeah. Go ahead. Are you kind of looking at it from the standpoint because he has set such this is the standard. You need to live up to the standard that you believe based on that, he then has the ability even though he is a, a good guy and all that to say, hey, you didn't live up the standard. We got to make a move. Is that kind of you're kind of drawing that line? I'm drawing that line, and I was going to use the way he handled, and we kind of had a difference of opinion, but I think we can agree the way he handled the Tommy situation. Like we saw it differently, but we both agreed the way he handled it was the right thing to mm-hmm. do, which makes mm-hmm. you think, okay, he's going to know how to handle difficult situations. Like that was the situation. Oh, when was, Tommy was looking, when was being yes, rumored for other jobs. When it was reported that he was possibly looking or being offered by another program. He went to Tommy and said, look, 
however you want to think and what it meant, what he meant by it, do you want to be here? Like, this is the direction we're going. You know, if you want to be, go, be somewhere else, that's fine. But if you want to be here, it's time to close mm -hmm. the door. Right. On all of this stuff so we can get to the business of building this program. Right. And I thought that was the absolute best way to handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, and when he handled that situation, I'll tell you another situation. The way he handled the Clarence Lewis situation immediately after the Fiesta Bowl, I thought was brilliant. It was like, yo, okay. That's something as a head coach that I see either he has naturally or he has been mentored well by his mentor right. to be able to answer that question in the fashion that he answered it and to pretty much let everyone know that story is over. Now right. we build this team. But he also then has to prove that he's also willing to defend his player, build his player up, but then also bench that kid if he's not going to the job. Absolutely. So, and those are all the things that we think he'll do, right? Yeah. That he still has to show me he'll do. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that Coach Freeman will make the right decision. Because honestly, there were some questions about whether or not he would get rid of Jeff Quinn and Del Alexander right away. Right. You know, what, what was the move he's going to make there? Well. We learned early on that Jeff Quinn wasn't coming back, but then there was rumblings that you know maybe he's going to keep Dell Alexander. When we come to find out, a lot of that was kind of smoke that he would be, he'd kind of you know it, it was known already that it was going to make that move, right? And, and so there's some evidence, but again, that's going to have to be the key. Yeah. It's easy. It's going to. I'm not worried about him firing guys that are just bad, just really bad. It's. It's are you living up to the standard that we've set? There's there's mm -hmm. a difference. It's not like you're the standard and then Dell and then that's it. That right. that's the only two options. Right. Sometimes the guy's a good coach, but he's not enough, and not that's enough. the thing keeping us from that next level. Absolutely. Those are things he has to prove. Now we can say all till till we want that he's going to do it, but that's what he's got to prove. Because putting together consistently putting together great coaching staffs is important. But and then also moving on from your mistakes, which again, like Nick Saban made a mistake in hiring after he'd won multiple titles already, and that's when he made Tosh Lupau his defensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. A horrible decision. Horrible decision. But he moved on from it really quickly. Yeah. And and so that's what that's what you got to do. That's yeah, gonna be key. We have seen, I get I guess we've seen the breadcrumbs. Right. In certain situations to say, okay, I feel confident. That when certain situations do arise, he's going to be able to meet the challenge, right, and make the right decision. Ultimately, right. we can only wait and see how things yeah. play out. Because we do agree, him doing yeah. so is going to be important to creating a dynasty. Absolutely, that's the key. I think Absolutely. he can keep this staff together and not long enough to win a title. Mm -hmm. We're having a dynasty discussion. I think they want to now, win a title together. Yes, they do. Yes. Now, winning a title makes it easier to then go hire that next guy. Right. I think that helps, but yeah. you've got to make those decisions because I don't think Ed Orgeron did that. Yeah. And he lost Joe Brady and he lost some different guys and he replaced – I mean, he thought Bo Pelini was the right move. Yeah. In Ed Orgeron's defense, he moved on from that after a year. I mean, you know, just there was a lot of other problems that Ed Orgeron had that caught brought that program down just other than Bo, Bo Pelini wasn't the reason that LSU is where they are now. It was yeah. – a lot of other stuff, but just Bo kind of helped expedite that expedite process. Yeah. Right. You're right. So I think the coaching aspect of it is important. I mean, just this, this is the one I'm going to kind of get into a, a specific person standpoint. Shoot. Okay. You've got to try to keep Chad Bowden as part of your institution as long as possible. He is a, can I use the word rock star? Yeah, you can. Yeah. He's a flat out rock star right, right now in the recruiting circles, especially with the parents, right. especially with the parents. And I was, did we have this discussion offline this week when we were talking about the vast majority of recruits we talked to, if it was strictly up to their parents, Notre Dame. Oh, it was, I think it was about, last week. Yeah, yeah, it was last week. Yeah. If it was strictly up to the parents, Notre Dame would probably land like. Sean, if it was up to parents, stars. Notre Dame would be a top five class every year, every year. under every year. Ty, yes. Charlie, yes. Davey, you know, and uh, <laughs> BK. Yes. It's up to parents. Notre Dame's a top five class every yeah. year. Yeah, every year. 
And Chad is just continuing that. Yeah. Doing a stand up. Chad's job. making it to where you're going to finish number one every year if it's up Absolutely. to the parents. Yes. Absolutely. And he's not doing, he's doing that with the families. He's doing it with the recruits. It's almost like before you even hear them talk about Marcus Freeman, the first name out of their mouths is Chad. Right. Like, man, I love Chad. I would, I would argue we hear, we, we might even hear Chad's name mentioned more with recruits. Yeah. Which is not under, which is understandable because that's literally his number one job. Yeah. Mar, that's a part of Marcus Freeman. That's an important part of Marcus Freeman's job. It's not his only job. Yeah. That's Chad's only job. Yeah. You know, like I could see Chad maybe someday also be kind of coming, you know, being promoted into that role that Lonzo Highsmith now has for Miami. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Uh, but, and then if Chad ever leaves, finding a person that's going to continue that the same way. Yeah. That's a very important piece of this too. Yeah. I think, Let's talk specifics of what the program needs to be in order to take that next step. I think the line talent and the line play we know on offense has been great. I think they've had multiple years where Notre Dame has been good enough to be a champ. Notre, let's be honest, Notre Dame's 2016 team was pretty close to being good enough to win a championship with the you know with the the line being part of a championship team when you compare it to like what Clemson had that year. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like right guard was an issue, but they were good at center. They were good on the left side. McGlinchey and 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 Nelson were both Nelson. second, third team All Americans. Alex yeah. Bars was real solid at right guard. Mustafa yeah. was solid at center. Right guard was an issue, but Clemson didn't have a very good line that year either, no. right? It, no. it was you couldn't win because of your offensive line right. that year. They could have won it because of the line in fifteen, because of the line in seventeen. Even the eighteen line with Jeff Quinn was good enough to win a title with that group in the same way that Clemson won a title with their offensive with their line. offensive line. They right. were very similar lines, yeah. not elite, not dominant, but good quality lines. Yeah. Right. 2020, 2015, 2014 uh, was a, was, was a, a, a bit of an, it wasn't a great year, but by the end of the year it was playing well, the 2013 line flat out, you could have won it. I mean, a team, you just couldn't sack Ian yeah. Blair, Tommy Reese that year. Yeah. 2012, you were there half the line, you know, the other half, not so much, not but so as, much. as he kind of was deeper and deeper in his tenure, you had that pretty much every year. And yeah. so I think offensive line. Now here's the thing. The Notre Dame defensive line has been really good in recent years. I do think that needs to get better. I, I do think the talent level needs to get better. I do think the coaching needs to get better. Mike Elson did a good job. This isn't revisionist history. And now we're going to bang Mike Elston. Mike Elson did a good job. His players were fundamentally sound. They tried hard. He was a good recruiter to a degree. Uh, he benefited from some recruiting that Keith Gilmore did. If we're going to be honest. Keith yeah. Gilmore's the guy that recruited Dalen Hayes and Adi Ogandiji and Khalid Kareem. We got to be honest about that, right? But he also, you know, Elson also recruited Isaiah Foskey and the Adam Yolas and, you know, th those kind of guys. Harry Heastan recruited Jerry Tillery. But, you know, they had good lines. Right. The, the, the issue, the thing for me is, but but now we're talking about taking that next step, right, and being an elite team year after year after year. Not only does the talent got to get better, the other part of it is they got to become a better coach defensive line. Elson did a good job. There's another level. And, and I think the thing that I consistently read mm -hmm. when I read about NFL teams looking at Notre Dame's defensive linemen, and this goes back to the, you know, to Tillery, it goes back to, you know, Kareem there was always a little bit of a concern about the lack of a, of an array of moves. Like each guy had like one move he was really good at or one or two moves he was really good at. But, yeah. and Elson was really good at like teaching the, 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 the using their sure. length, yeah. and, you know, the power moves, but like they don't have like an assortment of moves that they could really go to. Right. He taught the basics as good as any coach in the country. I would argue that and I would, I would argue till the day that I die about that. Mike Elson taught the basics of defensive line play as good as any team in the country, which just let just, okay, it's the basics. Now go play ball. Right. And it took advantage of your talent. Now to take that next step, however, I think they got to get to another level. They've got to get it to where not only do you have a player like Isaiah Foskey, but Isaiah Foskey now has a deeper arsenal to go to, right? Where, you know, you're just not better. Like Notre Dame's D-line beat up Clemson in 2018 because they just had better dudes. Yeah. I mean, their dudes were just better than Clemson's dudes. Right. Right. As simple as that. 
that's not always going to be the case. You have to not only have talent, but you also have like Keon Keeley can't come to Notre Dame and just rely on talent and basic fundamentals. He'll be a really good player, but to be a Will Anderson, a game changer, a you know, a Julius Peppers, an Indomitian Sue right. type of take a game over type of guy, Jason Moore, same way, Tyson Ford, all these D linemen they're recruiting, Bubakar, all of them, Devin Houston. They need a coach that can also teach them that second level. Take them to that next level. Okay, now they got football. They got D line play one on one down pat. That's great. Right. Nelson was awesome at that, and that's a this is a compliment. But now you need to start giving them some senior level classes to where they've got counter moves. They've got if this team does this, if my move isn't working, I got this. And I think that's the next step because for Notre Dame to be a dynasty. They have to have great play along, but they can't, they're not going to ever just out talent and out athlete the best teams in the country for three to five games a year. And what I mean by three to five games a year is you're going to have two games during the regular season, usually yeah. against an elite team. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes three, especially if USC gets good again. And then you've got the two in the postseason where you're going to play that team. Yeah. To beat those teams, your D line play has to go to another level. It's close. But it's got to go to another level because Notre Dame has to – and that, look, 88 team, I mean, that, you look at that 1993 defensive line. Good Lord. I mean, they just – they they embarrassed the Florida State offensive line. Yeah. I mean, the 88 defensive line didn't dominate Miami, but they they went toe-to-toe with a really good Miami offensive line and yeah. made big – I mean, George yeah. Williams had a huge play in that game. Right, including it yeah. getting that great penetration at the very end where he gets in Steve Walsh's face and he makes him throw it high, and that allows Pat Terrell to because yeah. remember he was beat. He was beat. He early, was beat early in the round. If yeah. Steve Walsh can just snap and snap that thing off, it's ball yeah. game. Miami wins. Who but wins because the Joe, rush, there you go. Yeah, he couldn't plant his feet and throw the ball. You look at the the Frank Stam's uh, strip sack early in the game. Right, that set an agenda that hey, we're here to play. Chris Zorch was a beast in that game, right? Yeah, Jeff Alm made some plays in that ball. game, right? Yeah, yeah, Jeff Alm was a was was a battler that game. Yeah. You know, rest, man, he rest in peace. So Notre Dame could beat you up in the trenches on both sides of the ball. That's why yeah. they beat Miami that year, and, and yeah. is they were they were the better team in the trenches, and then that made them good enough yeah. on the perimeter with Ricky with with Rocket. You know, in, in 93 with Lee Becton, with, you know, the guys that they had in 93, but especially in 88. I mean, the 88 team and the 89 team, they had legit big-time skill players. Yeah. They just didn't have – they had three and other teams had six. They right? said uh, – Wes Pritchett said the Michigan game was the toughest game. In 88? Yeah, they said they went to the Miami yeah. game knowing they were going to push them around. Right. They knew they were going to push their offensive yep. line around. You couldn't said, push Michigan around. They walked in and they saw Screpin Neck and Jimbo Elliott at like mm-hmm. 320 and 315. Yep. It was a heavyweight fight. And they yep. knew for four quarters, they were going to have to stand there in the middle of the ring and throw blow for blow. And yep. it came down to the last snap and a missed field goal. And it set the tone for the rest of the season. Right. And most people would probably look at the Miami game. You know, as the toughest game, but for them, just from a physical standpoint right. in the trenches. They're like, no, it was that Miami team. And we knew that's the way it was going to be. So to me, Sean, in order to, to consistently win, we agree that there has to be dominant line play, right? But here's, but here's why Notre Dame beat Michigan in 88 and 89. And that is that Notre Dame had the better athletes. Mm-hmm. Ricky Waters punt return in 88 rocket mm-hmm. with the two kick returns in 89 yeah. Notre Dame had better skill and that's the final piece because you can beat those teams up in a line but if they're just then running by you for 70 yard touchdowns especially in today's era because yeah. back then you could kind of get away a little bit more because it was such a physical yeah. grinded out game yeah. nowadays I mean in Clemson's a perfect example of this with their offense they, they don't beat people up they just go out there and you know, they're, they're, their line's good enough with their skill to go out there and, and, and be successful. So, did you watch? If you go back, and I, I know you love watching old games. So, as soon as I say this, I got the done, 88. I got the 88 game up now. Turn the 88 game, go yeah. to the second series. I think the series after the punt return, the next time Notre Dame gets the ball, Lou calls three consecutive plays. And the only thing that stopped Notre Dame from being up 14 zip and possibly blowing that game open is Tony Rice 
just being inaccurate early. Right. And right. they go play action to Rocket. He, he's he's beating the defensive back by like five yards. I just watched Ricky Waters just absolutely embarrass the Michigan punt return team. Oh, absolutely. And here's the thing about, and this is the point about the skill, and I'm going to go to that play, Sean, but uh, but the, the, the thing about about that 88 to 89 teams, especially with Ricky and and and, and Rocket is yeah. what y'all don't understand is Michigan didn't give up special teams touchdowns. No. Oh. Give up three in two years. That's why that's why Bo was so upset. Right. No, I believe I could especially be wrong on this. Yeah. But I believe Notre Dame scored more offensive, more special teams touchdowns in those two years against Michigan than they did defensive touchdowns or offensive yes, touchdowns. Offense. They did. At the very least, they scored as many because I think they yeah. only had one touchdown in that game in 88, right? Yeah. And they kicked, they kicked it. They no, had the field goals. Wait. No, they, no, they had the one touchdown on the special teams. And then they, uh, yeah, Reggie no, Hill had four. Had four You're right. Yeah. That's Reggie Hill had like four field goals. Yeah. But I think they only scored the one touchdown. And then the next year, they score. How many did they score in '89? I think they they, they in '89 they had the um, the one touchdown that was a it was like uh, Ray Zeller's out of the backfield, I believe. Final score right. was 24 to 19. So they only yeah. scored three touchdowns. So no, three in touchdowns. a two year stretch against Michigan, they scored four touchdowns. No, it was That's Anthony it. Johnson. Anthony Johnson right. out of the backfield. Short, yeah. Short pass. So four touchdowns in two yeah. years mm-hmm. against a, t- a pair of top five Michigan teams. Michigan was ranked number two, I believe, in both years. Mm-hmm. And and so, because, no, yeah, Notre Dame was number one in, ni- in 1989 when they played. Right. In, 1990, in 1988, Michigan was ranked number two, and Notre Dame was uh, – that Notre Dame had not jumped up in the rankings yet. They were 13th when they played the game. Well, I'm sorry, Michigan was ninth. So they had that game where they were ninth. Notre Dame beats them the next year. Michigan second. You're playing the number two team at the at the on the road, and you got one offensive touchdown. So the the, the reason for that is the skill is Notre Dame from eighty eight to ninety three. And this kind of goes back to the conversation that J- John James was making earlier. Yeah. I think James has taken an issue and turned it into an even worse situation than it is, and and that I don't think is accurate. Yeah, there's no talent in the secondary outside of one guy because he's ranked at such and such or whatever, right? Like, I don't agree with that. But I think the thing that we have said is it needs to get better. Receiver, there's good skill at Notre Dame at receiver. It needs to get better, right? Because the one thing about those two games, and this is the point I'm making, is Michigan was able to neutralize to a degree Notre Dame's dominance in the trenches, even if they won those battles, they didn't dominate those battles. Mm-hmm. And then it became about the skill. Notre Dame had better skill than Michigan. That's why Notre Dame won those games. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's where the, you know, and then there was a stretch from you know, like 90 to 93 where Notre Dame was putting guys in the NFL draft in rounds one and two and from the secondary like every year. Yeah. I, I You know, I mean, so they, they need to, again, we never said they don't need to improve it. They got to improve it. And I think that's that's going to be an important piece to this, and that's where they're not there yet. So if you look at this, like in 1990, in 1990, you had Pat Ter- Pat Terrell was a second round draft pick, Stance McGall was fifth round. The next year, Todd Light not only in the first round, but he goes number five overall. 1992, nobody because everybody came back. No, no, no. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Rod Smith, second round in the NFL draft pick. 93, Tom Carter goes in the first round. 94, Jeff Burris goes in the first round in the secondary. Willie Clark, who's a part-time starter, went in the third round. And then 1995, Bobby Taylor goes in the second round. I mean, so – so And Brian and, Young left early too. What was that, 90? He left after 90 mm-hmm. – he left after 93. But that he played four years. Right. Yeah, Tom yeah. Carter left early. Tom Carter left the Right, that's what we, you and I were talking about the other day. Because it was – yeah. So Pete Bursich was talking about that on Pete your show, Bursich right? Pete Bursich was saying Tom Carter and Jerome was Tom, to Tom Carter and Jerome Bettis were were part of the 90 class that yes. senior year would have been 93. Right. I think they'd have been okay if, without Jerome. I mean, offense isn't – the, Tom Carter coming back in 1993 would have been huge. 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 They don't beat. Oh, they don't lose Boston to Boston Taylor? College. They don't lose to Boston College. They no. had Jeff Burris, Bobby Taylor, and Tom Carter all in the same secondary. Yeah. They do not lose to Boston College if they have that. They do not. They do not. So the point is, 
there has to be better skill. They're mm-hmm. getting there. Yeah. But that part has to get better. And and then, of course, the final piece, Sean, is they have to do a better job with developing the quarterback position. I'm not going to say recruiting the quarterback position because I think Notre Dame has signed – in the last 10 years, Notre Dame has signed at least four quarterbacks that I think they could have competed for or won a title with. Yes. And that's – that that aren't on the roster anymore. Yes. They just weren't developed properly or they played on – and, and that's, that's Everett. Uh, that's that's Malik, that's Deshaun, and that's Phil Jakovic. I'm not counting Tyler because, again, I'm talking about guys who aren't on the team anymore. Right. Tyler, I think Tyler can be that guy too, but we're talking about guys that aren't that that are not going to have that chance anymore at Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. They didn't develop it correctly. The, the, there's again, I'll refer people back to the show that Sean did with Malik a couple weeks ago that we put in the chat last week. There was a problem de- with development. There was a quarterback culture problem that was created that's not there anymore. But just because that's gone doesn't mean that now all of a sudden it's going to be healthy because we still need to show that Tommy Reese can prove that. And then when Tommy Reese moves on, which, again, great assistants are going to move on. If Tommy Reese is good enough to be around a long time, he probably won't be around a long time. That's just how right. recruiting – that's how coaching all works those. nowadays. That's true everywhere. Bama, yeah. Ohio State, everywhere. So – that's going to have to be important for Marcus Freeman. The next hires that he makes, he's got to make sure that he's hiring people that know how to develop quarter, great quarterback play. Absolutely. Because Notre Dame has to have a great quarterback. The thing is, you know, you look at 88 and 89, did they have a great passing quarterback? No, but they had a great quarterback. It's it's about, you know, that was a different era. In 1993, was Kevin McDougal a, a, an elite NFL player? No, but he ran that offense about as well as it could have been run. And that's why they were a great team. Right, 2005, 2006, those teams were competitive. You take Brady Quinn off those teams and put just about any other quarterback in the country on those teams, and they're not, they're not what they were. Yeah, right. You have to have great quarterback play, in my opinion, at Notre Dame to consistently win. Right, that's a key. So I think from a player standpoint, Sean, got to be elite in the trenches. Got to continue to improve your skill. And then, of course, develop quarterback position better. I don't think we're de- recruiting quarterbacks the problem. I think developing and quarterback is the problem. There is no – when it's right, I preface by saying when it's right, there is no better glamour position no. in college football than quarterback at Notre Dame. Especially now with NIL. When you are the quarterback at Notre Dame, historically, you're a dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's marketable. And that's going to bode well. And we talked about this as well, Brian, because everyone, the name everyone is talking about and changing that narrative, of course, is Dante Moore, Dante right. Moore, Dante Moore, Dante Moore. And we're, we've shared this. The development of Tyler Buckner will go much further into recruiting and impact recruiting more than getting Dante Moore because right. recruits in 24, 25, and 26 right. will see Right. Tyler Buckner. If Tyler Buckner comes out this year and becomes one of those guys, one of the best quarterbacks in the nation, now we're cooking with grease. Right. Now, now we got a good fire going. And we expect Dante Moore to come into the class. Go ahead. I you I know you had something. Right no, there. it just a funny movie thing popped in my head. Oh, okay. Whenever you say cooking with grease, I just all for and it wasn't even grease. I just all of a sudden remember that scene in my cousin Vinny. Where they go to the diner I know and you know they get about. breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and the guy puts a big old thing of lard on it. Lard. He's like, uh, you guys aware of the dude growing cholesterol problem in America? <laughs> I don't know why that just popped in my yeah, head. You're right. I'm sorry, Sean. But that goes to your point about development, right? Right. The most important thing right. is the development yes. of the quarterbacks we have, along with recruiting. And right. like you said, the culture. Look, Malik laid it out. I had never heard anyone like plainly make it as succinct as he did. The culture that was there. And when we right. talked about it last week, the importance of how Tommy Reese deals with Tyler Buckner and Drew Pond. How that situation is dealt with is going to be an indicator of whether or not things have changed. Because the culture previously will, will dictate that this is how things are going to go with this quarterback competition based upon how it's gone 
with every other quarterback competition in the past. Mm-hmm. So those are things just to look out for. Right. I'm excited because I, I want Tyler to really, really right. be that guy. I the really name do. that was brought up, Sean, was Wimbush from James. And then I'm going to respond to another thing that James said. So, James, we should probably throw Brandon Wimbush into that conversation as well as a recruit. That would be fair. As a recruit. The reason I say – because, again, the point was development, right? Because my yeah. first response was, no, 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 because D- Wimbush wasn't the same guy by the time Chip got here. But that was part of the development problem in 15 and 16. Yeah. So I think James's point is good. You could throw Wimbush into that conversation too. Yeah. Because had Brandon been developed properly, Brandon didn't have to be Bryce Young in 19- 2017 for Notre Dame to win a title. No. He just needed to not be Tony Rice. That's the problem, right? He was Tony Rice, whereas they needed Jarius Jackson, right? I mean, is that a fair thing to say? I, Tony I, Rice I totally in 2017 would have been Brandon Wimbush. Jarius Jackson, Notre Dame wins a title if they had a Jarius Jackson at quarterback in 2017. That's my yeah. opinion, right? Yeah. yeah. And and Brandon could have been that and more, right? but he wasn't developed. So I think James is correct that Brandon Wimbush needs to be thrown in that conversation as well. And then he, he made another comment. He was agreeing with your point about the glamour aspect of the position. He says, but why does Notre Dame have a, a problem, hard time recruiting top quarterbacks? And I think that's the faulty premise. I, again, even if you know James wants to talk about recruiting rankings, Brandon Wimbush was was almost identically ranked to Deshaun Watson. Almost identically ranked. I think Deshaun was like 42, Brandon was like 43. Yeah. A uh, class apart, yeah. a year apart. Yeah. Gunnar Keel is a five-star quarterback. Yeah. You, you know, Malik Zaire was a top 100 to 150 guy, which is a basically where Jane, where James where Jalen Hurts was. Yeah. Phil Dracovic was a top 100 quarterback. And yeah. I would say criminally underrated. He just didn't get as much love because he didn't do the camps and and he played basketball, and then that was the year with Justin Fields and, and Trevor Lawrence. And obviously, if Tyler Buckner, when he when he was committed to Notre Dame, was a top 50 player, yeah, he fell out of the top 50 because he didn't play his senior year because of COVID. Right. If Tyler would have gone out and, and is a senior and, and thrown for 3,500 yards and rushed for 1,000 yards again, because I don't think he would have repeated yeah. the numbers the year before yeah. because he was playing against better competition, but he's still 3,500-plus, 1,000-plus, 60-plus touchdowns even at Helix, you know, he's a top 50 player, if not a five-star. Mm-hmm. And and Deshaun Kaiser was another guy that just – the ratings were stupid. I mean, Alabama wanted him. Notre Dame wanted him. Like, you can't tell me, looking at Deshaun Kaiser's talent, that he wasn't a top 100 quarterback. I don't yeah. care what the recruiting services said. So – and then Everett Golson was as good of a as good of a quarterback as, as Notre Dame has signed. I mean, I, I don't care what anybody says. I don't know According why he was ranked the, the way he was ranked. I think it was size. Was size to the quarterbacks that have played right they looked up to Ed right from a talent standpoint they all right. Ed was the best arm Ed, like that was the dude yeah you know and right. Jimmy Clausen's the only quarterback that Notre Dame is in the last 20 years that could that that, that, spin it. that you yeah. could say spun it better than Ev that's yeah. it Ev, but Ev brought he, so much more to the table than than Jimmy, absolutely. the runner and all those other types. And of he things. was his. They had a stronger arm than Jimmy too. 2012, he was just raw. Right. He was just raw. He literally just took over games without really knowing what he was doing. He would just take over right. games, you know. And of course, right. Tommy had to come in games like Pitt, right? You know, to close things out, right? He came into Stanford. Stanford was because Ev got hurt. Ev got hurt. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. he had to start against BYU because ever got right. hurt. Right. Right. But then you see the promise, even in the national championship game, like they were being nom- dominating the trenches, but Ed was but running for his life. I, still I, making plays. I would argue the Michigan game is the only game they needed to bring in Tommy, in my opinion. Oh, yes. Even Purdue, I don't, but it was more of a you bring him in because you have him. Right. Because you have Tommy Reese, right. who started a bunch of games and can do certain things. You brought him in because you had him, not because right. you. Needed him other than the Michigan game. They needed him against Michigan. If Tommy doesn't come off the bench against Michigan, I don't know if Notre Dame wins that game. I mean, that was and that was early, early on for Everett. So as as I think this was incredibly well said by Ed. Talking about Notre Dame, we don't develop QBs. We had no problem recruiting them, and and I think that's that's the key. That's why we said it's about development, not recruiting, and so. Um, I know Malik has told, I think, both of us that he played with himself. He played with four NFL quarterbacks. 
talent wise, yeah. Talent wise, like no question. Ev Deshaun himself, himself and, and Brandon. And Brandon was the baby. Yeah. When when he left, when he decided yeah. to transfer, that was his right. That was his because Brandon baby. had a stronger arm than all of them. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe I still think Malik had the strongest arm. Okay. I personally thought Malik had to, just just pure distance and velocity, and you know, and and Ev had a much stronger arm than Jimmy, right? And yeah. and I mean, you could argue of the four quarters you're talking about that Deshaun had the you know, weakest arm, you know, from a distance and a. I mean, think about that. Yeah, think about that. Yeah. And and I only say weakest because it's somebody's got to have the weakest. If I mean, you know, I mean, of of the strengths, then they were, you know. So so point being. I don't think recruiting quarterbacks been the problem for coach Freeman. It's going to be about finding an offensive coordinator and or quarterbacks coach. Cause I'm okay. If it's the same person, yeah. depending on who it is that can develop quarterbacks. Yeah. Because if Notre Dame simply just recruits quarterback the next 10 years, like they had the last 10 years, they're going to be fine talent wise, but then find better developers than what they had pre Tom Reese. Tom Reese is still, he's showing progress. He's showing me potential. Now he's now that Kelly's gone. Now show me what you're made of. Yeah. He's a lot like Marcus Freeman. There's still some unknowns there that we don't really know about him. So there's a lot of prove it there. Show me there with this current staff. So whether it's Tommy Reese or someone else or someone else when Tommy Reese, let's say Tommy does a great job, he's going to leave for something. Yeah, that's just how it works. And and uh, then Coach Freeman's got to replace him with somebody that can do it as well, if not better, that that's the, that's going to be the key because what Notre Dame's not going to have is they're not going to have what happened at Clemson. What happened at Clemson from a coaching standpoint was unique. And that is that Brent Venables turned down a lot of jobs to stay at Clemson. And And if, 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 look, let's be honest. Yeah. And if Lincoln Riley doesn't leave for USC, Brent Venables is still the defensive coordinator at, at Clemson. Absolutely. In my opinion. I mean, he left his son. Yeah. Wow, that sounded really bad. He left conti- being able to continue to coach his son to go to Oklahoma. And it, that's only because Oklahoma was the job. Because I mean, remember, he'd been there. He'd coached under Coach Stoops. Yeah. There was a connection with him, uh, with Brent Venables in Oklahoma. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that was that was very deep. And, you know, so he's from Kansas. You know, he played at Kansas State. I mean – there was a there was a big twelve ish connection yeah. for him there. Yep. And so, you, you know, so he's still there. Tony Elliott stayed way longer than anyone thought he was going to stay. Absolutely. Right. And, and so, it's just one of those things where you just you don't often see a guy keeping coordinators as long as Dabo was able to keep coordinators. And what's yeah. funny is is for all the talk that people dislike Dabo, I think like six. He's he's the guy that was able to keep his staff intact way longer, and I would argue too long, because I think there's a couple moves he should have made. Honestly, yeah. the O line coach that needed to be changed before this year. Absolutely. But the other thing is, like six or seven of his current assistants are either guys that played with him in college or mostly guys that he coached at Clemson. His almost his entire offensive staff now is former all Clemson players. So for a guy that that I keep hearing people say the players don't like and respect, mm-hmm. they got a weird way of showing it by coming back to coach with him. And that doesn't even include the fact that he had Chancey Stuckey on staff in a non-on-field role, Yeah, a former player. Former now, Chancey player. didn't play for Dabo when Dabo was the head coach, but Dabo was his position coach in college. Right. So, but that's that's a bit of a unique situation That that is, again, the anomaly from a coaching standpoint. Coach Freeman's most likely going to have to do more turnover because Notre Dame is such a unique place. Yeah. There's going to be more people. If Notre Dame has the success that Clemson has, there's no way Marcus Freeman, no matter how much the players, the coaches love him or whatever else, that he's going to be able to keep this staff as intact as he as Dabo kept the Clemson staff. Because yeah. there's going to be too many big schools throwing too much money at those guys. NFL teams, all of it. So replace and them. Wouldn't you say the toughness – from your program will come from your veterans, mm-hmm. the toughness and discipline. And like you said, the elevated skill more than likely will come from your young players that are coming in and your freshmen or red shirt freshman classes. When you get that perfect mesh of a national championship team, you know, that's, that's what Wes Pritchett talked about. Mm-hmm. Like this is an amazing story. 
he never saw Rocket until they played. So he never knew how fast Rocket was. Hmm. He said they would be, Barry Alvarez would have them on one side of the field and said they wouldn't see the offense, but they could hear Lou. And he said Barry would let them go and they would be done and Lou would still be coaching the offense. So he said it wasn't until he saw this kid run by him on a return in the first game that he was like, whoa, he's fast. <laughs> and that's just crazy, right? But it's, it's, it's that youthful exuberance and talent, and I think that's what that's, – that's why I'm so high on this team this year, and I right. think this team is being overlooked by a lot of people that are just – they don't want to be too optimistic, right? But this team is going to be tough. The veterans have been the two college football playoffs. They believe in themselves, and if they can find some difference makers – and some of these young players to come in and make some big plays and Tyler Buckner can become the quarterback we believe he has the potential to become, this team can make it to the playoff. Right. I'm not predicting right now right. on this day that they will be in the playoff. Right. This Notre Dame team – I'm saying I'm not going to predict it by the time we get to the end of the summer. Absolutely. But this I'm Notre right Dame now. team can make it to the playoff. That's all I'm saying. They have the makings of a playoff team. They do. The final piece to this, Sean, is the institution. Finally. <laughs> there are some things the institution has to do differently. Now, one thing is Notre Dame needs to always value its independence. Mm -hmm. And I don't just mean that from a conference standpoint. Notre Dame has to always be the standard bearer for doing things the right way. Yes. Having said that, I kind of sometimes look at Notre Dame – and their definition of the right way in a similar fashion in which I'm a big believer in amateurism, amateurism, Sean, so are you. Mm -hmm. The issue that we had is we just didn't think the NCA properly defined what amateurism was. Right. They set a standard of amateurism that was really not about true amateurism. It was more about, we want to make sure they're not getting their piece of the pie and that all stuff, right? We can right. all, we should all be able to agree on that. But I don't think amateurism is the way the NTA did it or nothing. I think that's that's a very narrow mind, not narrow minded, narrow focus and like just that's not the standard. I believe in amateurism. Right. NIL does not make them not amateurs, right? Because they're not being paid, they're not employees, they're not workers, not getting paid by the institution for their football ability. Their football ability is allowing them to do some things to help them earn some money, and I'm fine with that as long as it's not the schools or the NCA paying them. Yeah. Okay. That's my, that's my stance. Other than like the school paying them, there's some things I think the school should do. I've talked about this. I think every institution, if you're going to be an NCA institution, every single sale that you make that has any type of players, Jersey number or face on it should always be put aside into a, a slush fund, so to speak, that when players graduate, if they don't, make an NFL roster and stay in the NFL for X number of years, they would then get that. And so if you don't make the NFL and you graduate, you get X amount of dollars that are part of this fund. Right. Yeah. Because to me, that's more of, that's the way that the institutions can say, Hey, we're going to make sure that we're taking care of you mm -hmm. to a help you get on your feet as you get jobs to help pay for some medical costs that would be incurred from your time playing for us. Right. Since we can't, so, you know, you're not under our umbrella anymore. Right. I think those things should have happened. That's the only paying players that I support. But that's only once you graduate. Like you got to graduate to get that. That's yeah. something that's a different conversation for a different day. But they have to be willing to say going with certain things that are happening in in college Man, athletics yeah, yeah. doesn't mean you're not still setting the standard. Right. Being more open to this NIL reality doesn't mean you're losing sight of what makes your institution unique. Right. And as long as the school, and I expect Father Jenkins to be gone soon, I think that's going to be a good thing for Notre Dame. I think Jack Swarbrick's going to be gone soon. Yeah. I'm not as excited about that because I'm a little bit more nervous. I think Jack Swarbrick has done a great job at Notre Dame. I agree. I think Father Jenkins is I'm, – I'm so past ready for him to leave. Uh, you know, but the new president, the new father, whatever, the new president yeah. and the new AD, because that's going to happen sooner rather than later. Just 
age and different things. And I, I've been told Father Jenkins is, is probably, you know, nearing the end of his career. Same with Jack. They have to be willing to say, we're going to hold firm very, very tightly to the belief that as a, as a Catholic institution, as an institution that, that thrives on being a place of academic excellence and cultural excellence and excellence of faith and all these other things, there are certain things we're never going to allow. But that doesn't mean you can't embrace some of the changes from an NIL standpoint, from you know having great facilities, having the best facilities in the nation does not mean you are sacrificing academic excellence. That's an absurd quality, absurd sort of parallel to draw that I don't think they should be drawing that I think that Notre Dame has held on to that for too long. There is nothing wrong with having the best facilities, the best yeah. this. Now, does that mean that your facility has to have a slide in it? No, that's stupid, <laughs> right? But, and I'm not talking about having an arcade. I'm talking about like your locker rooms are the best. I wouldn't mind those things best. when we go watch but, practice. But Brian, that I to me, <laughs> I like, Sean, things. dude, where were you during practice? I'm out here trying to, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, dog. I was, like, I was, I was watching, I was watching. The I, was in, the I was in there in the arcade. Um, that would so be us. Um, my point is, however, that's how I'm talking about great facilities. There's yeah. no reason that you can't take more pride in, you know, ha silly, like having air conditioning in your dorms, whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Like having the best facilities, having the best locker room, having the best field, having scoreboards, having this, ha none of those things mean you don't care about academic excellence. Here's what, here's what means you've sacrificed academic excellence and cultural excellence. You make an athlete dorm. No, I don't want Notre Dame to ever do that. I don't want Notre Dame to ever separate the athletes from the rest of the student body. The That's a sacrifice you don't here, make. They don't want that either. No, though. right. From a recruiting standpoint, that's a selling point for other places. Mm -hmm. That is sacrificing what makes you unique. Yeah. But having the best locker room, having the best weight room, having the best indoor facility, having the press field, being yeah. in the arms race, there's nothing wrong with that. No. Being paying your coaches as much as the Alabama coaches are being paid doesn't mean you no longer believe in excellence from an academic and cultural standpoint. Absolutely. That's something that the Notre Dame leadership needs to understand is there's this silly notion that, well, we're not going, we, we are an institution of academic and cultural excellence. So we are not going to do this. Those two things have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. If you're a place of academic excellence and you have the best law professor in the country, or the best history dean or the best whatever, aren't you going to make sure that that person is paid in a, such a manner that's going to keep them here to continue your academic excellence? Yeah. Of course. I don't see, you know, I, I highly doubt Father Jenkins is out there taking pay cuts. I doubt Jack Swarbrick's only making 20 grand a year, right? Yeah, it, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with saying in order to maintain excellence in every aspect of it, we have to spend a little bit more over here than maybe some people are comfortable with. That's right. But just because our coach makes $12 million a year, just because we have one of the five highest paid coaching staffs in the country, doesn't mean that we're still not demanding that our players go to class every day and get legitimate educations and partake in what makes and, and building them up as young student athletes. And the fact that Notre Dame has kind of made that qualifier or, or it has always seemed kind of stupid and petty and and behind the times and just arbitrary. Those are some of the changes that the institution needs to make. And if anything, you could say, hey, we're going to demand even more from you in those areas because we're not paying you as much as everybody else. We're not even going to hold you even to a higher standard of you better darn sure make sure that your team GPA is here right. and that your graduation rate is here and that players aren't getting in trouble over here because – you're paying, being paid quite handsomely to do so. Yeah. Right. And Look, so to me, that's going to be an important piece of, of this. And that's process. something that, you know, people focus on Bob Davey, a lot of other issues, but what really started Notre Dame in the fall at the end of the Lou Holtz era was the constant back and forth. He had to go through with the right. administration. Right not having his bag, not being supportive of the program, trying to hold on to these traditions and thinking right. that the traditions were constantly under constantly under attack, you know, due to the success of the football team and worrying about the football team becoming more famous than the school. It's like, are you, the football team has been more famous than the school for a long time. Mm -hmm. 
for a long time. Like that ship has sailed. Like there's no reason to even worry about that. Right. A lot of folks use the term the right way. Right. I think the staff has been open and honest about not only to recruits, but to alumni and the fans. Like we have to open our minds to change right. our perspective on the right. Correct. Fit. Stop Correct. that. Correct. The right fit is not what we've known traditionally. It doesn't when have it to be a to... private school from Connecticut. It no. could be a public school from South Florida. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that that kid couldn't thrive at a place like Tony Rice in under the Brian Kelly in, a, administration would not have been considered. He would not have been a guy they found shopping down a different aisle. No, Jerome Bettis either, who just got his degree. Right. No, and two of the best ambassadors of Notre Dame football right. and the university that you can find. To me, doing it the right way is doing it in a way that strives on excellence, strives on having some sort of moral fiber of who mm -hmm. you are. Yeah. Has an idea of your job is to not only develop great football players, but to develop outstanding young men. We're yeah. talking about the football program here. Part part of excellence means, you know, making sure that that we are a, a first class academic institution, and that football players are not excluded from that aspect yeah. of it, like they are at other institutions that are also very good football institution or yeah. academic institutions. You know, University of Miami, for example, uh, they're going to be brought into that culture. They have to adapt to that academic culture of excellence. But it doesn't mean that th th this whole doing it the right way thing, there's things that Notre Dame has done that make them sort of NCAA-ish. Yeah. In that, is that really the reason that you're not willing to pay your coach the most? You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's 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 some, are, you know, no. If, if Marcus Freeman proves to be someone that can win championships, develop outstanding young men, hold, Notre, hold the Notre Dame standard true, then he should absolutely be among the highest paid in his profession. Absolutely. Just like you would do for any dean or professor or whatever the case may be. If you don't think spending money to, to keep and maintain people of the proven success, then you don't truly believe in excellence. Yes. Because excellence is something that you just do some of the time. Why does Notre Dame spend so much money on first class buildings? Because they view that as something that you know the the per, the the visual perception, the aesthetic perception of excellence. We want people to walk on this campus and be awed. Odd. Well, how's that any different in saying we're going to make sure that our football coaching staff, who's done this, this, and this, and, and this is something that I it, it, this is something I think you know. In fairness to Brian Kelly, but yeah. the the reason I think part of the the hold up for for Brian Kelly is Brian Kelly didn't always do it the right way. And, and how he developed his program and how he interacted with his program. So I'm not saying he necessarily should have gotten that, but if Marcus Freeman is who we think he is mm -hmm. and the kind of coaches he's hired, then it, the Notre Dame as an institution needs to be willing to step up and say, we're going to make sure that you have everything you need. As long as you understand that you're bringing in men that are like Chancey Stuckey, that are like Al Washington, yeah. that are like Mike Mickens, that are like, you know, these type of people where we're going to demand that every, if you're going to be an assistant coach here, you're going to be one of the five pot highest paid people at your position. But you know what that also means? You have a much higher burden for what we're going to demand of you. There's a level of expectation for what you're going to be doing on the day-to-day -day lives. And if you don't want to be here, it's like, look, you come to Notre Dame, you're going to get paid as an assistant coach. Right. Here's the thing. You're an assistant coach of football, man. No. I'm sorry. You can't. So right, you can you can have both of those things be true. Yes. But you can't say we're going to hold you this high standard and then not pay you like that. And until the institution understands that, that paying people top dollar does not equal uh, a sacrificing what you believe in, as long as the people you're paying the right way understand and adapt and, and believe in doing it the right way, then you're going to, you're, you know, you're, and, you're, and you're, this you're is not, you cannot fool the fan base. This no. is not the Chicago White Sox where people don't come unless right. there's a winning team and the ownership can say, well, we don't have right. the money. The fans right. aren't coming. No, this is Notre Dame. You can't fool. Right. There's no fool in the fan base. We know there's, there is money to play. 
Sean, if in, Notre Dame decided we are going to have the highest paid coaches in the country, yes, they would sure. have no problem raising the money no. to make sure that that was true. No, no. Now, theoretically, I do think there was a time recently where there were a lot of alums and big money people who would have been less willing to give that money because mm -hmm. they didn't believe in the specific coach. Oh, yes. Yes. I'm talking more big picture. Uh-huh. If a Lou Holtz, a Marcus Freeman, a, you know, somebody like that was there, then I think there'd be, there'd be no problem doing that. Yeah. Hey uh, guys, look, my offensive coordinator just got offered two 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 and a half million dollars to go to the NFL team. I, I need a million dollars done because yeah. you just won a championship Yeah. because you just made sure that you, you know, had your, your players are graduating. Your kids are out in the community every flipping week doing this, 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 and this you've represented our institution at a high level. Mm -hmm. I think that's an issue that a lot of people about Brian Kelly, he made it very known that he didn't necessarily like Notre Dame was always an impediment to him. He didn't, he, it was very clear to a lot of alums and I've learned this even more. So the last three or four years, a lot of alums did not view him as someone who, had the same respect for the institution as other coaches. And other coaches. Yeah. Charlie, you know, Lou, people like that. Era. Yeah. And so they they would have been less willing to support him, <laughs> but it wasn't a lack of funds. It was a lack of, yeah, but I'm not giving it to you. Yeah. That's not going to be the case with Marcus Freeman. No. And so it wouldn't be an issue there. So the money's there, in my opinion. It's just, does the school, is the school willing to do it? <laughs> And you know, is are, are the people with the money going to be willing to do it for him? Yeah, that specific guy. I don't think that's an issue anymore. Yeah, I mean, for me, when it comes to college football, Notre Dame is synonymous with the Yankees. Notre Dame is synonymous with the Lakers in the NBA. Notre Dame is synonymous with Man, you know, Man U, you know, Manchester United uh, over overseas. Like it is the brand. It mm -hmm. it is like if you're the quarterback. If you're the center for the Lakers, you're a Hall of Famer. If you're the quarterback right. at Notre Dame, you should be right. the highest NIL earning, championship garnering athlete in college football. Right. It's like it's synonymous with that. And that we believe right. that's what can be delivered over the next five years. Right. We believe that. That's the final piece to a dynasty. That's the only way you can sustain it in today's era is you've got to get over some of these arbitrary things that you don't think are about excellence. Yep. And and when the institution r realizes that those two things aren't aren't at odds with each other, yeah. Pouring a lot of money into your coaches and your program doesn't mean you don't care about academics and cultural excellence and all those other kind of things. They yeah. do not have anything to do with each other. Yeah. It only matters if you're pouring that money into someone who doesn't represent your institution. Absolutely. And I don't think that's going to be an issue with the current head coach no. or his staff. No. So someone, someone said, don't forget the cubbies in the chat. That's funny. That's, that, that has to be sarcasm. Yeah. I don't watch baseball anymore. So Sean, let's dive into the final piece to this. This is going to be, let's have a little lightheartedness fun. Let's do it. So as we look at the, you know, Lindy's came out, so you knew I had to go buy that. I went out to the grocery store like three straight nights. So you thinking, prefer Lindy's over Athlon? No, I prefer I prefer Lindy's over Athlon because Lindy's is out now and Athlon's not. Okay. I buy, I the only one I don't Athlon. buy is Phil Steele. Yeah. I, I buy all of them. I'll buy Street and Smith. I'll yeah. buy – and it was Sporting News for a while. I'll buy Athlon. The only one I don't buy is Phil Steele because it's just – it's like reading a foreign language or code. It's like I just – I can't – there's just too much – Phil's just, I can't do it. I would collect them on our summer trips and we would be driving and my parents would be driving us down south mm -hmm. or like down out west to Oklahoma oh, yeah. or somewhere for trips and we would stop, stop in the gas station. I went in every gas station with my dad because I wanted to see regionally who was on the front yeah. of the magazines. Yeah. That was like the, one of the best parts of the oh, trip, yeah. stop, stopping at the gas station and checking out the, the magazines. Absolutely. And uh uh, I'd be lying if I said that my wife and I didn't go on a cruise recently, uh, recently, like 10 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, when she looked at my backpack and saw that I had five preseason magazines, she was like, seriously, Hey, you know, it's gonna hey. be a lot of reading time. You That's got right. your Karen Kingsbury book. This is what I got. This is what I, okay? <laughs> this is what I got. 
Uh, Lindy's is only one out so far. That's why I'm I'm reading Lindy's. But that's out. We've seen all these online preseason top 25s. Mm-hmm. So what Sean and I are going to kind of have some fun with here as we wrap up is looking at who are the teams that we believe are overrated and underrated. I think that Notre Dame is in an okay spot with most people. Yeah. Like They're between like 6 to 10. You know, I've seen one at like 12 or 13. Those are outliers. I think six to 10 is I'm comfortable with. I would probably have them higher than like eight or nine, but it's not like they should be five and they're eight. You're idiots and you're way off. Like, come on. It's like a few spots and whatever. We can have this conversation. Right. So I think they're close ish to where they should be. And we'll have a show down the road where we'll talk about where we specifically think Notre Dame should be ranked. Cause we'll come out with our own top 10 at some point in time this summer. But they're looking around the country about where other teams are ranked. We are going to give you three teams that we think are overrated coming into the season and why. Mm -hmm. Three teams that we think are a little bit underrated coming into the season. And then we're going to give you a sleeper team. So, and then, like I said, we'll wrap it up by talking a little bit about Clemson. So, Sean, the first team that you and I believe is overrated is uh, the same. Uh, our first and third are the same. I don't remember who your second was. Did we have the same three? I had an SEC team number two. Uh, SEC, I had Florida. Okay. Then we our number two is not the same, but our number okay. one and our number three is the same. One our three. number one, Yeah. and I know someone in your family, that two people in your family are not going to like this very much, but I think the ranking of USC is absolutely patently absurd. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like so, you're telling me that Lincoln Riley is going to go to USC, take some of his coaches and players, yeah, yeah, inherit a team with four and eight last year, and be better than what they were at Oklahoma last year. That's the thing. Oklahoma hasn't been in the playoff the last two years. No, oh. you know, and Oklahoma goes out and gets. I mean, they didn't even have Lincoln Riley didn't coach the bowl game. Bob Stoops did, right. Right. And so, you know, it's not even like you could say like Oklahoma, you know, finished the year in the top 10. Uh, That's because of what Bob Stoops did, not because of what Lincoln Riley did, because going into that bowl game where where I'm trying to look what their ranking was going to the bowl game. See here, where's the schedule? Yeah, they were 16th going into the bowl game. And. They had climbed up to number four, uh, number number eight. Or number eight in the rankings, and then they got smacked by Baylor. And then they j- fell to 13, barely beat Iowa State, seven and six Iowa State team, then went to Oklahoma State and lost, fell to, and they were 10th and they fell to 16. So you're going to tell me he's going to be 10 spots or so higher at USC yeah. than he was at Oklahoma just, some, just because he took some of the players there and and some of the coaches and his best assistant coaches still in Norman, O line coach. Yeah. And he inherits a team with a that went four and eight last year and lost their best players. That's absurd. Yeah. I just look, is USC going to be better? No question. But six and six is better. Eight and four is better. Yeah. How much better? To me, that's the difference. And and I just I I think it's insane that that people are predicting USC as a playoff contender they, coming into the season. Look, they're just not ready in the trenches. No. And you can talk about both sides. Game, the last game of the season, and Notre Dame's going to push them around. Yep. They're going to push them around. But I look into the in the conference. Utah is going to push them around. Mm-hmm. UCLA. You see, Oregon's going to push them around. Yep. There are too many teams that are good on both sides of the ball in the trenches. And I just don't see them running through just being able to line up, especially if he's going to line up. Well, we know he would prefer to run counter all day Mm -hmm. and go play action. And like the G wraps and the, yeah, right. He would prefer that. He can't do it this year. He, He can't do it. So, you got to move people to do that stuff. Yes, and Caleb Williams is probably going to have to throw the ball on average 45 to 50 times a game for USC to have a chance. Once again, defensive side of the ball, defensive line, not stout enough. They 
what has some talent transfer in at the linebacker position. So the linebackers should be much faster than what they were. They had some injuries in their recruits over the last two cycles that are really damaged uh, their depth at the linebacker position. And normally they're able to recruit defensive backs in the mm-hmm. state of California, but they're still they'll have skill. Yes. I mean, and that's why we're not like, oh, they're going to go four and eight again. They're going to have skill. Not yeah. only the guys coming back, but the guys that they brought in as transfers. They're going to have skill. Yeah. But this isn't a seven on seven league. Yeah. This is still tackle football. It may not be in 10 years, but for now, it's still tackle football. Yeah. So I just, I don't understand. I don't understand that obsession that people have yeah. with USC. Again, because it's not even like Oklahoma the last two years has been Oklahoma. I mean, Oklahoma has had two back to back perceived down years yeah now their down years are still like you know nine and two ten and two and things like that but they have they have underachieved the last two years yeah and i just don't understand why people perceive them the way that they do and uh it it, it really it's a little mind-boggling to be completely honest with you i mean they struggled to beat texas both of the last two years and texas has been has stunk the last two years yeah They've struggled against Iowa State the last two years. They have. So I just I don't understand. I don't under I don't understand it. Yeah, they lost to Iowa State by a touchdown and had two wins over Iowa State by a touchdown in the last two years. So I just don't understand. This is at Oklahoma. So I, I don't I don't get the I think Lincoln Riley's a very good a, a brilliant offensive mind, but he also hasn't proven that he can turn a program around. He inherited a great situation. Yeah. Right? Like you know, I just I I I think they're vastly overrated. And let's let's be real. Let's be real. They go to Utah. They go to UCLA. They go to Stanford, a team that dominated them physically last mm-hmm. year. And Stanford was injured, Brian. That wasn't the best Stanford team. Right. They're going to be better. They physically dominated USC last season. Right. That's not an easy win. They go on the road to an improving Oregon State program. And then Notre Dame, that's like the, they have the capabilities of losing four to five games easy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and will they? I don't know. But there's – I mean, look, like you said, at Stanford, home against Fresno, at Oregon State. Oregon State's an improving program. That's an improving team. Right. That's Arizona State at home. Before. Right. Arizona State and Washington at home should be wins. At Utah. Yes, that's tough. By week at Arizona should be a win, but Arizona's yeah. getting they're getting better. Mm-hmm. Cal at home, Colorado at home should be wins. And then you look at um you look at, at UCLA and Notre Dame. So a team that lacks depth, a team that lacks physicality mm-hmm. is gonna play their two most physical opponents in the last two games of the year. And you know, I it just you know, I don't I don't I don't see it. I nine and three at best is USC to me. Yeah, I best. agree. And that puts him in the top 25, right? Yeah. But, you know, I just I I I don't see it with USC this year. And 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 it wouldn't shock me if they're if they're 9 and 1 and ranked in the top 10 coming into the UCLA game. I hope they are. Right. You know, like oh. I could see them, you know, losing only to Utah because they they don't really because we talked about like Oregon State, they're still not very good football teams. No. It's a pretty soft schedule. Yeah. They play Rice non-conference, Fresno non-conference. They don't play Oregon in the regular season. They don't play Washington in the regular season, although Washington wasn't that good last year. They do play Utah because they're in the South. Yeah. And then they play UCLA and Notre Dame. So I mean, I just I don't I don't see it with USC. Number two, my number two most overrated team. And I think you and I have a difference of opinion on this one. Not that we think that the other's overrated, but just who the number two is. Texas A&M. Yeah, I gave is you the wrong cr- team. But, you have A&M as well? No. Who did you have at three? Because I, I Michigan. Yes, okay. We did have the same one at three. Yeah. Yeah, go mm-hmm. ahead. Go ahead. I gave you the wrong two, though. I still gave you the wrong two. Who's your two? North Carolina State. Okay. They're, they're I, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. I'm going Texas A&M. Okay. And, and the reason I'm going Texas A&M is because, it, it, again, it's like they are now – they are the new Michigan – for mm-hmm. the pollsters. Remember for like during Harbaugh's tenure, like every year, this is the year that Michigan, you know, make, I just think it's funny that Michigan made the playoff the one year that they weren't getting any respect going into the season. 
Right. But there was always this like, oh, this is the year that Michigan shows up. And it's like last year, it was like, you know, Iowa State, North Carolina, and, and Texas AM was the top six. They were, I remember some polls had them like between six to eight last year. One had them at like five of the preseason right. deals. And they go eight and four because they're, not, oh, but they were nine and one the year before. Okay. Nine and one in an SEC only schedule in a year where COVID was just a mess. Mm-hmm. They got smacked by Alabama, barely beat a four loss. Uh, Florida team, and who else did they beat? Mississippi State, Arkansas, South Carolina, LSU, who stunk, Auburn, Ole Miss game got canceled, at Tennessee, fired their coach. And who do they play? They beat Vanderbilt by five. And then they go to a bowl game, and they beat North Carolina by 14, but it was a competitive game, and North Carolina didn't have De'Ami Brown. They didn't have Michael Carter. They didn't have Javante Williams, and they didn't have uh, Chas Surratt. I mean, Sam Howell was the only top player for North Carolina that played in that game, and they still couldn't really blow them out the way they did. Yeah. So they were overrated at number five. So then they're a preseason top ten team coming into this year, and they go eight and four. And it was a, in my opinion, in an embarrassing eight and four. To be honest with you, you know they have the big win, and they beat Bama. You beat Bama and went eight and four. Yeah. You know, and and barely beat Colorado, who's garbage. You got smacked by Arkansas, and that Arkansas game was only a 10-point game because the quarterback got hurt. K.J. Jefferson got knocked out in the second half. And then Arkansas just stopped, just started handing the ball off. And the ball off. And still and and couldn't, game, right. yeah. You lost at home to Mississippi freaking State. You lost to Ole Miss on the road by 10. And then you got beat by freaking LSU, who had already fired their head football coach. Yeah. And you know, I'm just like, oh, but 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 they beat Bama, Woo! <laughs> you know. So I just I don't get it. Uh, I don't see this as a top ten team. No. I don't think they're a top fifteen team. No. That and then they also lost some pretty good flipping players to the NFL. And in Jimbo's four years at Texas A&M, he's lost at least four games in all but the COVID year. And, and as I said, Sean, they lo- and, and the other thing we're not talking about is they lost Mike Elko, too. I mean, that's the thing is Mike Elko's gone. And he was part of the reason they were even as good as they were, in my yeah. opinion. And so I just – I do not get – they lost Kenyon Green was a first-round pick. The Marvin Lell, Leal was a third-round pick. Michael Clemens, they lost two of their starting defensive linemen. And they lost Isaiah Spiller, who's the fourth-round pick. So – I mean, a bunch of freshman defensive linemen are going to come in and replace those two studs, no. and you're going to be better than this year. No, you know, you're you're going to take a kid that transferred in from LSU, couldn't stay healthy, and could barely win the job there, and and that's your answer, quarterback, when you couldn't even, you know, I just I think A and M's incredibly overrated, overrated, incredibly overrated, I and yeah. I think Alabama is going to absolutely murder them this year. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I don't think that game, Sean, is going to be competitive. And, and I think their schedule is tougher than than. I think their schedule is going to be challenging as well. And and okay. let me just quickly go through their schedule. They play Miami at home. That's not going to be a cakewalk. No. They play Arkansas in Dallas, like or in in Arlington in the Cowboys' home. But at Mississippi State, at Alabama, that's four of their. St- that's four. That's four straight games, Sean. They play Sam Houston at the start. It's a really good FCS team, but they'll they'll kill them. They play App State at home. They play Miami at home. Arkansas in neutral field at Mississippi State, Alabama. That's the start to their season. Then they get a bye week. Then they're at South Carolina, who's getting better. You got Spencer Rattler. Then they have Ole Miss at home, mm-hmm. Florida at home, at Auburn, home against UMass, and then home against LSU. That's pretty tough. That's not an easy schedule, and they're yeah. gonna they're gonna go ten and two, eleven and one against that. Yeah, no, not yeah. happening. Yeah. Not happening. Yeah, I'm going back and forth. I said NC State. So I let's won't... hear the reason why for NC State, because I because I'm because I'm I have some thoughts on NC State. I want to hear your thoughts on why. Well, you, my thoughts are they're like top fifteen twenty. Like everybody's like top like, fifteen twenty. Maybe might win the ACC this year. Yeah, but their departures remind me of what North Carolina lost. And Sam Howe came back and he was pretty much by himself in that offense. And he struggled early and then kind of righted the ship. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Devin Leary is kind of going to. He's not going to have that left tackle, right? He's not going to have both of his running backs. And everything's going to be on his shoulders. And I think early on they might lose a game that they are not expected to lose. And they might – and I mean, the expectations for North Carolina State are probably, what, 10 and 2? Yeah, I mean, you've got – Sean, you got people having them as like a top 15 to – like, I've seen 13, I've seen 15, yeah. I've seen 19. Yeah. It, like somewhere around there. I mean – I just I just worry about Devin Leary having to do too much. Yeah. Early on. So I like what you're saying because you're not saying you think he's overrated because I love Devin Leary. No, no, no. Not at all. But he's just not a guy that can just put a team on his shoulders. Yeah. We saw that with Sam Howell last year, Sean. Exactly. I mean, he can't do that. I mean, yeah. like that was that's your point. That's the yeah. point you made. Is like yeah. we saw what happened when Sam Howe lost all those weapons, and he could put that the team around him wasn't good enough for him to put him on his shoulders. He's not Lamar. Yeah. Right. And, and they'll get better. And by the middle of the season, okay. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure early on. And their schedule's not super easy either. No. They start at ECU, which is not a cakewalk. No. They have Texas Tech at home. They play at Clemson, home against Florida State, not going to be easy, at Syracuse. Syracuse is an ascending team, in my opinion. Home against Virginia Tech, home against Wake Forest, no cakewalk. Home against BC, no cakewalk. At Louisville, at North Carolina. There's a lot of losable games. Those four weeks from Wake Forest to uh, North Carolina. North Carolina, that's – because I think Wake Forest is – I would take Wake Forest right now. Even it, even with it being at NC State, yeah, I would take Wake Forest right now. I think North Carolina by the middle of the season. I think Notre Dame is catching North Carolina at the right part of the yeah. season, which is early yeah. on. Yeah, you I and think, I agree on that. Yeah, because they were a young team last year. I think they're going to be even. They better. were overrated last year. They're being a little underrated. They're underrated this year, this year. Yeah. absolutely. That's like you said. That's a I think study. I feel the the way you feel about Wake is the way I feel about Boston College. That game, okay. I, I that game against Boston College. Let me say this about NC State. I love Devin Leary. Uh, he is I, I just he's a winner. Yeah. My biggest concern with NC State is more about Dave Dorn. Mm. He just has not shown me he has he can put he can string back to back good seasons together. That's and yeah. and it's years when the team is kind of expected to be good is when he's had some issues. Yeah. Like it's almost kind of like he play he he's better when the expectations aren't high. Yeah. And they're going to be high this year. I mean, this no consistency. It's like three and nine, eight and five, seven and six, seven and six, nine and four, nine and four, four and eight, eight and four, and then and then nine and three last year. Yeah, you know, and, and yeah, I I think they have the talent to be a top twenty team again. Oh yes, I but I just that. don't have a lot of faith in Dave Doran. Yeah, that that's where I'm with you yeah. on that one. He's yeah. got to show me he can string together back to back years because I would argue his 2018 team was disappointing. I mean, they went nine and four, but I would argue they were they were a disappointing nine and four. Yeah, that year. Uh, I mean, that that they they the schedule was set to where they should have been better than that. I mean, they lost at Clemson. You expect that? Lost to A and M in a bowl game. Got embarrassed. Lost at home to Wake Forest. Lost at Syracuse by ten. Yeah, their other wins were James Madison, Georgia State, Marshall, Virginia at home, who wasn't good that year. BC at home who wasn't good that year. Florida State at home wasn't good that year. Uh, this is this is 2018. That's the year that Notre Dame destroyed yeah. Florida State at home when this game Ian got hurt. Uh, won at Louisville in 2018. They weren't that good that year. Beat North Carolina on the road. They weren't that good that year, and it beat East Carolina. So, I mean, North Carolina, if you remember, 18, they were two and nine. That was yeah. a Larry Fedora coach team. Yeah. So they went nine and four, but that was a very unimpressive nine and four. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they were expected to be better. And so I just I just don't have a lot of faith in Dave Dorn. And I even think his best team, the 17 team, underachieved when you consider the talent they had on that football team. Yeah. I mean, you had Ricky yeah, Person at running team. back. Yeah. You had your entire you had a you had defensive linemen that didn't even start on that team that got that, that yeah. played in the NFL. Yep. Your entire starting D line was fourth round or higher. You had a, a starting middle linebacker that's now starting middle linebacker for the Super Bowl runners up, Jermaine Pratt. Right. You had NFL players a lot of, and you were oh. nine and four. Yeah. You know, so so I just I, I'm not a huge Dave Dorn fan as a coach. I just don't think he's I don't think he's been able to kind of I mean, oh, and, and your quarterback is Ryan Finley. Yeah. 
who's a good quarterback. Good quarterback. So I'm sorry, I said Ricky. Um, I said uh, I meant I meant Naeem Hines is who I and Jalen Samuels is who I meant to say they had a running back. I said Ricky, um, Ricky Person, but that's not what I'm referring to. So anyway, Sean, I, I think NC State's my second, and then Michigan's my third because I'm seeing a lot of Michigan in the top ten stuff. Yeah, and um, yeah, you sum it up because I yeah, I think Michigan's season this last year was very fluky. Number one, I think they had a lot of games you look at and say, I just don't know if that's repeatable. Yeah. You know what I felt about last year's team, Sean, and I mean this as a compliment to Michigan. This is not meant to be an insult to Michigan. Michigan's football team last year reminded me a lot of Notre Dame's 2012 football team in that yes. they were a good running team, great mm -hmm. line play, had some high-level players on the on the defensive line, good skill but not great skill, won a lot of close games. Some of the teams on your schedule weren't as good as you thought they were going to be. You know, like like Michigan beating Washington early was a lot like Notre Dame's beating Michigan State early that year. Remember, Michigan State was like preseason top ten, and and you know they ended up being like seven and six that year. But Michigan last year beat Rutgers by a touchdown. Should have lost to Nebraska. Uh, lost to Michigan State. Struggled against Penn State. Should have lost that game. Great, great finish to the year, right? A, a yeah. lot like Notre Dame did that year. Once they kind of gained some confidence, you know, beat Ohio State, great win, beat beat Iowa, great win, and then they go to a postseason game. I view those two wins as kind of like beating Stanford and Oklahoma yeah. in 2012, right? Stanford was every bit as good as Ohio State was last year as a team, yeah, you know, top five-ish kind of team. Yep. Uh, Notre Dame beats them. I think that Ohio Michigan's win was more convincing than Notre Dame's, but that's also because Stanford – had a much better defense than Ohio State had. Beating Iowa was a lot like beating Oklahoma that year, right? Yeah. Beating Iowa in the in the conference championship game. And then they go play Georgia, and they just prove they don't belong. And then now you're going into this year, the recruiting at Michigan in recent seasons has been very disappointing. So I don't think they're going to be able to just reload the way that people think that they will. You know, losing Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo, there's not natural replacements to to, to do that, and and no. that's kind of what Notre Dame went through in 2013, when they went from national runners up to nine and four. You know, lost Manti, didn't have a natural replacement for him. You know, lost uh, you know, lost um, Zach. Mar no, they didn't lose Zach Mar. I'm trying to think. Lost Zeke Mata. You lost Manti. You lost Cap. You didn't have a natural replacement for him because your recruiting was so thin. Um, th th to me, that team just lost lost Theo, yeah, lost Sierra, you know, just lost some really important pieces to that team. Kavari was there; he was still young. You just you, you just didn't have the same recipe, yeah, right. Yeah. In some of those games, you were winning in close games. You lost the next year because you were you were winning a lot of it was let's be honest smoke and mirrors right and so you know i just you had this the offseason injury to stefan with the hernia so he was never the same player they just lost some really important pieces to that football team sean and yeah. i think when you look at michigan i would argue they even have less impact players coming back because at least notre dame still had eifert coming back you had zach martin coming back in 2013 you know, you saw Chris Watt coming back. You know, you still had Lewis Nix coming back. Yep. You know, you still had some guys coming back from that football team. And I just don't know if I could say that Michigan has that, you know. And, and so, it. yeah. And, and it. you know. You, you, They're going to hang in their hat. They're going to hang more slaughter. Uh, Zeke, Theo, Manti, yeah. Tyler. Oh, they did lose Tyler Eifert off that 2012 team. That's another yep. one. That, I couldn't remember if they lost Tyler or not from the 2012 team. They lost him too. Sorry, my apologies. Continue with what you're saying. No, I'm just saying Michigan, they're going to hang their hat on their offense. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, they lost both coordinators as well. Right. That's a whole other thing. Yep. And will McNamara hold off right. the charge? you know, to, to keep the quarterback position. I will say they have those 
quick athletes that are mm-hmm. good with the ball in their hands. Yeah, especially with Ronnie Bell coming back. Ronnie Bell, right. AJ Henning, they Mike have Coburn. Two, Mike uh, Coburn, yeah. yeah. They have two or three of those guys that can make their offense dangerous to cover. And, you know, it'll be about their offensive line and whether mm-hmm. or not they can be dominant. But like you said, just overall talent. They lost they lost Dax Hill on the back end. That's they lost three first round picks. Look, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. David Ajabo was a second round pick in the same fashion in that Jalen Smith was a second round pick. Yeah. It was because of an injury that happened after the fact. Jalen right. was in the last game of the year. Ajabos was in prep work. Right. David Ajabos is a top 15 pick most likely if he doesn't injure his knee. And Dax was a first-round pick. Aiden Hutchins was number two overall. They, had, they lost three first-round picks from that from that defense. Right. In my opinion. Like, first-round talents. Let me yeah. rephrase that. They didn't lose three first-round picks because he wasn't picked. Right. They lost three first-round talents from that defense. And Hassan Haskins, losing him is being is, – is being, is not getting enough credit because of Donovan Edwards. And I like Donovan Edwards, but Hassan Haskin was a was a physical beast the second half last year. Dependable. Power like, and runner. he just, I mean, he yeah. like, yeah, the line played great, but you had him just hammering yeah. Ohio yeah. State in that game. Thanks for the super chat, by the way, K Grant. Really, really appreciate that. But I agree with you. I think Michigan's overrated. And again, is Michigan they're gonna suck? No, they're not gonna suck. I mean, the reality is, is their schedule is so soft. That that alone could get them, you know, a little a little higher ranked, I think, than they than they than they should be, to be honest right. with you. Because I mean, they're non-conference, Sean. I mean, it's it's embarrassing for Michigan to have have this as their non-conference. A team that's all for years, for decades, has played good, great you know, non-conference schedule. Yeah. yeah, this is their non-conference schedule: Colorado, all at home, Colorado State, Hawaii, UConn. They don't play Wisconsin. Yeah, this is their schedule. Those three teams, and they have Maryland at home, at Iowa, at Indiana, home against Penn State, by home against Michigan State, at Rutgers, home against Nebraska, home against Illinois, at Ohio State. So their schedule is not super tough, but they're yeah. going to lose at Iowa. I think yeah. they're going to lose at Ohio State, and then between between Nebraska, Michigan State, and Penn State at home, they're going to lose at least one of those games. Yeah. That gets them to nine and three against a crap schedule. That's not a top ten team. People are talking about them being a top ten team. They won't be. And Ohio State is going to flat out destroy Michigan this year. Oh, they're they're chomping at the bit to get back in Michigan. Yeah, chomping at the bit. Yeah, and and the thing is, the reason I say that it's not just oh, it's payback time. That's not how really football works. It's that's part of it. It's because it's because they lost their best athlete in the secondary. Yep, and they lost the two pass rushers that negated their speed. You're not going to have those guys this year. Nope. That pass rush is going to hit home like it did last year, which means you're going to have to cover longer than you did last year, and that's not a good recipe. No, and and I don't think Ohio State's going to be any great shakes on defense this year. They're going to be better than what they were last year. And unlike the Notre Dame matchup, because I'm going to say things about that matchup that are going to sound a lot different than what I'm going to say about the Notre Dame Ohio State matchup. But the difference is game one versus game twelve in that system. There's a difference. And so that's the other reason too. So that's that's my third overrated team, Sean. I think nine and three is the best that they can do. And against that schedule, nine and three is not going to be that great. No, and I wouldn't be great. completely shocked if if they're eight and four. All right. I wouldn't be completely your, shocked. You're overrated. I mean, you're underrated squads. Same conference. Yeah. My number one underrated team this year is well, yeah. My first underrated team. I don't know if they're my number one. I, I I'd have to think about the one and two, but the first one is Penn State. And and I don't normally say that because Penn State's normally very overrated, in yes. my opinion. Yes. But and this is also part of the reaction to kind of some things that were said on our show this week. I I don't I think Penn State it, it has been weird the last two years. They're eleven and eleven in the last two years. They have been a very strange team. And and you know Sean Clifford's not a great quarterback by any stretch, but I feel like he is a kid that when he is healthy and right, they win. And, and when I look at Penn State the last couple of years, and I look at, for example, last year, you know, you go on the road and you beat Wisconsin to start the year off. It's a good win. You beat Auburn at home. That was a good win. They beat Villanova, beat Cincinnati 24 nothing, and they are smoking Iowa in the first half of that game. It was like it was like 20 to three or something like that, right? Right. And Sean Clifford gets hurt. And Iowa comes all the way back. And I mean, Penn State couldn't complete a pass in that game. They ended up losing 23 20. 
They get a bye week, and then Clifford comes back against Illinois, but he's not 100% or anywhere close to it, and they lose it home to Illinois. And then the next week at Ohio State, they give Ohio State a game. And then they smack Maryland, lose a very close competitive game to Ohio State, smack Rutgers, and then lose a really close game at Michigan State. So they lost at Iowa, who was a Big Ten championship game representative. They lost at a 10-win Michigan State team by three. Yep. They lost by three to Iowa, by three to Iowa, lost by nine to Ohio State in a very competitive game, lost by four at home to Michigan, who was a playoff team, and then they lost in nine overtimes to Illinois. They were a really quality – and then their wins, for the most part, were not close, right? I mean, you know, they had a close one over Wisconsin, close one over Auburn, blew out Villanova, blew out Indiana, blew out Rutgers, blew out Maryland – you know, blew out Ball State, teams they should have. And they've got some really good players coming back on defense. They lost some guys. Getting Sean Clifford back and healthy, losing to Jahan, Jahan Dotson is going to hurt. Yeah. But I like Parker Washington. I like Keandre and Lambert. And last year, one of the things that hurt them last year is their running backs were garbage. <laughs> Nicholas Singleton is going to take over that job day one. I mean, they get the best running back in the country, in my opinion, yeah. coming in this year. Arguably the best running back in the country, Nicholas Singleton who's going to add a lot to that run game. Now their number one and number two backs last year can now maybe become complementary players is what they should be. Yeah. So I think, and, and they've got a good tight end. I think this is going to be a quality football team. I really do. I think they're being underrated. I've seen a lot of rankings don't even have them in the top 25, which I understand based on the last two years, yeah, they two have years, not yeah. been a good team the last two years. But, uh, you know, but I'm either – and I'm going to be proven right or wrong by the third game of the year <laughs> because their season starts at Purdue, home against Ohio, and at Auburn. That if first game isn't easy. That no. first game is not easy. If they're two and one coming out of that, then I think I'm going to be proven correct. But, but they have – the thing about Penn State is they're the opposite of Michigan. They have a really challenging schedule. Yeah. And they play uh, at Michigan, home against Minnesota, home against Ohio State, at Indiana, home against Maryland, at Rutgers, home against Michigan State. The, 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 they they don't have an easy schedule, but I just think people are not giving them enough respect this year. I, I think I think Penn State's got a chance to surprise some people this year, Sean. What I what, what who, who's your top underrated Penn State, team? Penn State. We agree on Penn State. Okay. After Penn State, I went with. I just think, man. I think their defense will be much better. They return a lot of starters on offense. BYU is going to be a challenge offensively because they're a physical team. And that matchup with Utah is one I'm going to watch early in the season. I'm going to love to watch that game because it's mm -hmm. going to be a physical game. Offensive line is huge. They love to run the ball. They have a few playmakers that I'm looking forward to see if they can take the next step. I think BYU is underrated, and I think they're going to end up being a top 20 team. I think they're going to be end up being a top 15, top 20 team. And then Tennessee. Right. Real quick loss. about BYU. Real yeah. quick about BYU. You and I's number one team, or not like or the the my my number one, your number two, yeah, are in a very similar situation in that we're gonna know right away. Right away, if, yes, if we're correct, because after playing South Florida in the first game, they play home against Baylor and at Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> if they split those games and, and the loss is competitive, then I'm going to – because they're going to beat Wyoming. They're going to beat Utah. They're going to lose to Notre Dame. But then they, they're they home against Arkansas. I think it's a winnable game. So, to you know, to your point uh, – It's a tough yeah. schedule. Yeah. If, if they can – if they can – and if they somehow are able to win both of those games – Yeah. You know, That's I – That's kind of yeah. like – um Similar to what Cincinnati did, when you know you kind of project when your team is going to be good, right? And you stack the schedule, right? To give your team a chance to be considered for the playoff, and that's what BYU has done. Yeah, yeah. So you said your third team is uh, my my second team is Boston College. Okay. I think Boston College being vastly underrated this year. I don't yeah. think people are giving enough credit to what they looked like when Phil Dracovic played. Mm -hmm. Even the version of Phil Dracovic that was clearly not even close to 100% late in the year. 
Yeah. They were four and two last year with him as their starting quarterback. I saw one ranking that had them in the 60s and another that had them even lower than that. Uh, Lindy's has them at like 39. I, I would even, I would say that's about, that to me would be the floor. I think Boston College is going to be a much better football team than people think that they're going yeah. to be. Yeah. I think when you look at them last year, they went six and six last year. They were two and zero oh in, in crushing teams. They didn't play anybody any good first two yeah. games. Yeah. And then beat Missouri in overtime. And that's kind of when teams figured out, okay, here's how you beat them without Phil Dracovic. Mm -hmm. They lost a close game to, to the Clemson. And then that's when the wheels kind of fell off. Lost yeah. to Syracuse. He comes back. They beat Virginia Tech. They beat Georgia at Georgia Tech. Then they lose to to back to back games to Florida State and Wake Forest. So they didn't finish well. But they went four and two with Phil as the starting quarterback. And so I, I think they're going to be better this year. I think their schedule is not easy, but it, it kind of it, you know home against Rutgers at Virginia Tech, home against Maine at Florida State, home against Louisville, home against Clemson. I'm not going to be shocked if they upset Clemson this year. And we'll we'll get to that in a second. At Wake Forest, that's going to be tough. Home against at UConn, home against Duke, at NC State, at Notre Dame, home against Syracuse. So that's a very challenging schedule. But to me, that's going to keep them from being a top 25 team, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. But I still wouldn't be surprised because they've got some dudes on that football team. Yeah. And that's what I don't think they're going to – and Jeff Hafley is a very good football coach. Mm -hmm. And they and the, the big thing, too, is with all the coaching turnover this year, he was able to keep his defensive coordinator. Right. That was huge. And then John McNulty was a solid hire. That's right. a good hire for them, in my opinion. So as long as the O line can get figured out, I, look, they got a thousand yard running back comeback. They got one of the better receivers in the country coming back. George getting George tackles was huge. Jalen Gill comes back, and then Phil comes back. I yeah. think BC is going to be a much better team than people think. Having them in the 60s seems insane to me. Yeah. You know, like so I think now, do I think they're going to be a top 15 team? No, because their schedule is just too hard. In right. my opinion, and then and they still don't have enough talent on defense. That's the I, I like their defensive coordinator. He's a good young coach. He wasn't my pick for Notre Dame. He was one of the finalists for Notre Dame. He wasn't my choice, right? Because I just think he needs a little bit more seasoning in that role, you yeah. know. Um, but he's done a nice job there with not a lot of talent the last couple of years. Like the athletes at BC now are not what they were when Don Brown was there. I mean, no. they don't have NFL players. They used to have NFL players on defense. John Jackson, Harold, Land, you know Harold Perkins, Harold Perkins, Harold Landry, Harold yeah. Landry, you know uh, J uh, the Allen kid, right? The other defensive end that they had, they had NFL guys. This yeah. team, this team last year didn't have NFL guys on defense. But it's getting a little bit better. Yeah, you know, and and he's a good coach, so I think that was that was important as well. Who's your number three underrated team? You said Tennessee, Tennessee right? Tennessee. I just yeah. love what Josh Heupel did in developing Hendon Hooker last year. The offense is going to get better. You were the first one to point this out to me when I had all the love for Georgia last year. And you were like, Sean, you need to go watch that Tennessee game because schematically, Hype will figure some things out to attack that secondary that no one else had done. Right. And, and that was with a depleted receiving core. That was with a depleted receiving core, which they've upgraded that through recruiting and the transfer portal. They have some, some difference makers, and they've improved their offensive line. Look, they played Georgia tough pretty much into the third quarter. They beat Kentucky. It's a super tough team. They should have beaten Pitt in their first game. They really mm -hmm. had control of that game mm -hmm. until a couple of turnovers and Pitt eventually won and Pitt went on to win the ACC. They had a tough schedule, and I think they showed themselves well. If that defense can improve, because you saw the shootout they had with Purdue in the bowl game. They can score. Yeah, They're going to score. It's all about that defense and whether or not the recruits they've had over the last two seasons, whether or not they can come in and, and, and improve enough to get to nine wins and maybe challenge for that SEC East. Because like I said, they gave Georgia a decent game. Now they have to go to Georgia this year. So that's it's a little different animal. A little different. That's a little different beast. But that Georgia defense, I don't think – I don't anticipate the Georgia defense being as stout. Now, they still no. have athletes. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. They're still going to be really good, but yeah. there's top two good, and then there's yeah. top – like, I thought Georgia had the best defense in the country last year. What yeah. I've said is they get too much hype is people want to make it out to, like, this generational, you know, all-time great. And I yeah. just didn't think it was that. that yeah. That's that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So – Tennessee, in my opinion, has an opportunity 
to be that second team in the SEC, SEC East? For me, my with Tennessee, it's gonna be it's gonna be about the def- defense. Absolutely. It's gonna be about can to can Tim Banks get that defense. I was just looking to see how many starters they come they got coming back. And they actually have a lot of starters coming back on defense, which is important because they were super inconsistent last year on defense. Yeah. You yeah. know, like at times they're like, okay, they're figuring it out, and then at other times they're like, uh-uh. But like you said, Sean, they had some games you're like that they lost that you're like, boy, they could have beat Purdue in the bowl game, right? I mean. You know, gave, could have beat Pitt. You know, could have beat Ole Miss. You know, I just think they wore down, and that's when some of the injuries they had. Their their issue, the only concern I have about Tennessee, Sean, and, and, and I agree with everything you said, the only concern I have is is similar to, you know, one I have about other teams of coaches who are in year one and two but didn't inherit a great situation. So, like, Marcus Freeman, what he inherited is a lot different than what Josh Heupel inherited, right, and, and what Lincoln Riley is inheriting. And the only issue I have with Tennessee is still depth. Like last year, they showed they couldn't afford injuries last year. They just didn't have the depth of talent last year. Are they better yet? I, I don't know. But you look at their schedule, like you said, it's it's a it's a it's a challenging schedule. I mean, they get they get LSU and Alabama both in crossover games, which is not easy. They always get Alabama because it's it's one of their rivals. But you know, you get Kentucky at home, you get Missouri at home, you get Florida at home. I think that's the biggest thing for Tennessee is the fact that. You know, the, 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 like to me, they play at Georgia. That's a lot. This is like almost one of those years where you're, you're glad you're playing Georgia at Georgia because you're probably going to lose to them anyway. Yeah. You know, just, just my opinion. But what about the next group of teams? You get the next three best teams in your division, you get them all at home. All at home. Yeah. You know, so, you know, maybe South Carolina is a little better this year. I mean, they, they're a bit of a dark horse for me. I just, I got to see it with Spencer Rattler. I just, you know, I need to see it first, but I do like what Shane Beamer is doing. But, but I mean, Kentucky you get at home, Missouri you get at home, Florida you get at home, and that's that's going to be the key. And I think they're going to pe- beat Pitt in the second game. I, yeah. I do. I mean, Pitt lost way too much yeah. from last year's team, in my opinion. So I I like Tennessee. I don't have Tennessee as underrated, or because I think that they're 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 you know um, they're ranked like what twenty yeah. in most twenties, thirty yeah. where they look. I just think they can sneak up if they get one big win. And I'm not even saying if they beat Georgia, the big win would probably be against Florida. Because I think Florida beat them pretty handedly last year. Yeah, um, Florida beat them. They beat thirty-eight fourteen at Florida. Yeah. That was yeah. before the wheels came off for Florida. Right. Yeah. See and... what's that rivalry looking like right now? And now the problem is Tennessee did lose some guys though, but getting Hook, Hendon Hooker back was was key. It's really key. See what the, I'm going to look and see what the recent history is like for Florida and Tennessee. Oh, I'm sure it's heavy Florida. Yeah, I would imagine so. Florida has won every game since 2016. So they've won five straight and they've won. I mean, Tennessee beat them in 04. Since then, beginning in 05, Florida has beaten Tennessee in every year except for 2016. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yep, I, I I think that would be that would be, and, and Sean. So so to to your and point, I think that's the main SEC East rival. But rival I think this is rivalry. the point that, that that I think is great that you're making, is if they beat Pitt in game two, because mm-hmm. like my thing, my thing is I don't think they're un, they're underrated because I think you know they're kind of between like twenty to twenty six. Yeah, and I think that's about fair. But here's here's what I'll say. If they beat Pitt on the road, which I think they will, if they beat that Florida game is early, that's their Stanford 2012. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the 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 giant they haven't been able to slay. That's Good not point. in Alabama, right? Right. And then they get a bye week, and then they're at LSU. They could easily be five and zero oh, yeah. going to play Bama yeah. at home. Yeah. So let's say they lose that game. They're still five and one. They're going to be top fifteen. Then they get UT Martin at home, Kentucky at home, before they got to go at Georgia. And then after Georgia, they finish their round out with Missouri at home, winnable, at South Carolina and at Vanderbilt. That's a possible 10 and 2 schedule right there, Sean, Yeah. Which would make yeah. them a top 10 to 15 team, which yeah. then would make them underrated of people that have them outside the top 25. So Absolutely. that Florida game is going to be Florida LSU back to back with the buy in between mm-hmm. to me. 
to define their season. Yep. If they can win both of those games, Sean, then you're gonna we're gonna look back and be like, man, Sean nailed that one. He had Tennessee underrated. They went ten and two, and depending on what happens to Georgia, I mean, ten and two, you know, could have them kind of going into some late season games thinking, gee, if Kentucky can pull off this upset, maybe we got a chance to. A chance you know, win the division. Yeah. It, it's unlikely, but or at least tie for the division league because then Georgia yeah. would win the head to head. But it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very, very interesting. I, I like that pick. My third pick is Minnesota. Mm. I, they're my sleeper team in the West this year. And, you know, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not a huge PJ Fleck fan. I think PJ Fleck's a really good football coach for that level. That, that, that's my thing with PJ, that he's at the level he should be at, Minnesota. Yeah. I, I think that they are going to have one of the best, like after Ohio State, right? So clearly the best quarterback running back tandem in the Big Ten is is the one in Ohio State, it's C.J. Stroud right. and Travion Anderson. After that, you could make a strong case that Minnesota has the best quarterback running back tandem coming back because – if Mo Ibrahim doesn't get hurt in the opener last year, he's in the NFL right now. Yeah. And, you know, he got hurt early enough to where I don't think it's going to impact him this year. He got hurt in the opener. He but was, they were working he was Ohio working State. working Ohio State yes. <laughs> Before he got hurt. Yes. I think that, number one, Minnesota doesn't play Ohio State or Michigan in, in, in the crossover. Right. And they, and they play at Penn State. And at Michigan State, which isn't easy, but losing Mike Sanford was a huge benefit. They brought back Kirk Siriaka, I think is how you say his name, from Penn State. He's the guy that helped build them up to that 11-2 team. He left to go to Penn State, which was dumb, and now he's yeah. back. Yeah. And and he's a much more balanced guy. He's actually he's a real offensive coordinator. Yep. And, and they you, lost a lot. You, you are sly, boy. <laughs> You're good. You're good. You're good. All I caught right. at least three. I caught at least three. Go ahead. So, uh, we don't need to talk about why Colorado is going to suck this year. Um, but uh, they got Tanner Morgan's back for his ninth year. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, sixth year. They've got two of their top three receivers are coming back. They mm -hmm. lost a lot on the O-line. That's the only thing that gives me concern. They lost four starters in the offensive line, but they've got a good O-line coach. I think they'll be fine. I, I didn't know a lot about Joe Rossi last year, but when he was considered a candidate for the Notre Dame job, I watched a lot of film. The last thing, he's a good football coach. Mm -hmm. And when I look at Minnesota, Sean, they got a lot coming back from their football team. They've got seven starters, five starters coming back on the offense, but Again, a lot of that's the old line. Almost all their skill comes back. Defensively, they bring back six starters, a lot in the secondary. They've got some good some good young recruits they've landed that are emerging. I think they've upgraded their coaching aspects of it. And because they were so woefully undercoached last year, it was like embarrassing. Yeah. And kudos to PJ Fleck for quickly recognizing the mistake that he made. And again, that's the sign of a of a of a good football coach is can you can you recognize yeah. right? Can you recognize when you made a mistake? It took him probably a year longer than it should have to yeah. recognize that Mike Sanford wasn't the guy, but he recognized it and he moved on. Yeah. And so, you know, and you look at their team last year, they lost to Bowling Green by four, mm -hmm. they lost to Illinois by eight, they lost to Iowa by five, and they lost Ohio State by 14 in the game. They were winning when Mo Ibrahim got hurt. Got hurt, yeah. They were not far off from being a better football team than they were last year. And then they beat West Virginia in the bowl game. So I'm looking at this, and I'm and I'm seeing Minnesota went went nine and four last year. Who did they beat in the bowl game again? Uh, West Virginia, 18 to six. We should have they seen. they beat seen. Wisconsin by 10. They blasted Indiana, blasted Northwestern, blasted Maryland, beat Nebraska, who was, the, like, as we said, was the best three and nine team in the history of college football, beat Purdue at Purdue, blasted Colorado, and beat Miami of Ohio. They're nine and four, and Lindy's has them ranked 56th. Yeah. And I'm like, hold on a second. Like, nine and four, schedule's not easy, but it's, oh, it's, You've got New Mexico State at home, Western Illinois at home, Colorado at home, dear Lord, uh, at Michigan State. I'm I'm not super sold on Michigan State. That's going to be the first test for me and my theory about Minnesota. 
Then you're home against Purdue at Illinois. There's a pretty good chance they're at worst five and one heading to Penn State, mm. maybe six and zero oh. at Penn State. That's an L to me. Then you come back home against Rutgers at Nebraska is going to be a challenge. So and then you're you're you start you finish the season off with home games against Northwestern and Iowa and then at Wisconsin. Mm. That's a nine. That's a potential nine and three year right there. Eight. It you is. know what I mean? It is. And that's way better than fifty sixth in my opinion. So, like, that's a borderline top 25 football team right there. Yeah. And they're not getting a lot of love. So you have to know that I believe what I'm telling you for me to put P.J. Fleck and James Franklin in my underrated list. Yeah. But I really think that, that Minnesota is going to be, a, is, is gonna be a, a quality team this year. Yeah. I do. Iowa offensively, I think, is going to continue to struggle. They yeah. lose their big game guys, special teams. They made a lot of plays offensively on reverses yeah. and yep. screen passes. The secondary won't be as good, in my opinion. I mean, they're usually good in the trenches. That's who Iowa is. That's their identity. Mm -hmm. And then but losing the they, center doesn't help. No, no. And then a really good center, like it's not, that's an elite center, first and, round draft pick at center. Yeah, right. and you know, Wisconsin is Wisconsin. Right. I expect Paul Chris to have them ready, and they will be a good team. Jim Leonard's going to have a good defense. Yep. Solid front seven, but they lost a lot at linebacker. So that, that Big Ten West is going to be interesting. And I think Nebraska is – is, I didn't even look to see where Nebraska was because they could be my other one. Um, I could see Nebraska being a sleeper because they played Ohio State tough. They, they impressed me in the trenches. They're 48th here, which – they went three and nine last year, and they got yeah, in the top just, fifty. Right? They just didn't have a quarterback, and they didn't have right. the guys outside. They got to prove it to me, but yeah. I could see them being a factor in that. The point, my point was, I could see them being a factor in this in the race in, 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 the, in yeah, this thing as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so, Clemson, yep. We just don't know what to say about Clemson. Well, sleeper team. We're gonna do that before Clemson. Who's oh, yeah, your sleeper yeah. team? Who's your team that maybe is even ranked in the top 25 that you're not going to say underrated? Because, like, for me, I'll give mine. Yeah. Mine's Texas. Right. And the reason I'm going with Texas my sleeper team is because I could see Texas not being very good, but I could also see all the things kind of working together, and they're really good. Yeah. And win the Big 12. Now, I don't think they're a playoff team, but, I, you know, I, I think that I think that Texas is a team that – I'm not willing to say they're underrated because they still have a lot of question marks for me. But Texas is a team to me that I'm that I'm like if the, the I'm not a look I'm not a Quinn Ewers guy. I think Quinn Ewers is a pretty overrated recruit. If I'm going to yeah. be completely honest with you, yeah. You know, people talking about you know oh generational this and that. And, and no, he's not that guy. But he's not terrible either. And he's going to have one of the most explosive receivers in the country to throw to. They the receiving core as a whole is going to be is going to be pretty decent in my yeah. opinion. You got Xavier Worthy who's coming back; he'll be a sophomore. You've got Jordan Worthy, who's a nice player. Isaiah Nayer. You've got some other weapons at receiver. You got one of the best running backs, if not the best running back in the country, coming back in Bijan Robinson. They return three starters on the offensive line. They just signed one of the best offensive line classes in the country. It's not like seven or eight guys. Yeah. A couple of them are capable of playing as freshmen, and Kyle Flood's one of the best line coaches in the country. And so when I look at Texas, I see a team that just didn't know how to win last year. Like you look at their game, Sean, what they finished five and seven is in that what they were last year? They five and dominated, seven. They dominated Oklahoma. Early. Right. Dominated Oklahoma. Choked, they didn't know how to win. Yeah. They lost. Uh, they, they blew out T uh, Texas tech. I mean, they were, they were five and four and one at one point. Then they choked the game away to Oklahoma. They blew the a fourth quarter lead twice against Oklahoma State. Lost to Baylor by a touchdown. Lost to Kansas in overtime, and lost at West Virginia by eight. They just didn't know how to win. Yeah, but they could have won. There was only one game last year they couldn't have won, and that oh. they got blown out by who? It was like some weird Iowa State smacked yeah. them. They had a chance to win every other game that they played in. Yep, I agree. The reason I'm not ready to say they're underrated, because I could see them being a top 10 team by the year's end, but the reason I'm not ready to go there yet and say they're underrated, underrated and more as a sleeper team is because I don't know if Steve Sarkeesian can fix that. Yeah. 
He wasn't yeah. exactly a, a world beater at Washington. When they were seven and six, eight and five, pretty much every year. He's never shown me he can be a guy that can get that team to that level as a head coach, offensive coordinator, different story. Yeah. And so it's just, it's more of a question mark. But if Sarkeesian has learned from his USC Washington days and has that team kind of can get that team to know how to win, mm-hmm. that's a, that's the most, to me, the best roster in the, in the Big 12, top to bottom. And he's put together a pretty good coaching staff. <laughs> I agree. So that's my sleeper team. I'm not ready to say they're underrated yet because I they got a lot to prove to me. But if if the but if the pieces all fit and he push can push the right buttons, I could see Texas being a top ten team by the year's end. Yep. Yep. And my, yep. My sleeper team, Cincinnati. Okay. They're just being dismissed as a top 25. They are being dismissed, and I think at this point, Fickle has laid the foundation that they're a program now. Mm -hmm. Like that last couple of years are more of a trend than just something that's going to have this uh, precipitous fall off. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't see that. So they are 21st in Lindsay's. Lindy's. Yeah, I can see them easily being in the top 10. By yeah. The first game of the year is going to be the key. Yeah. At Arkansas. That's going to be Ooh, the key. That's another sleeper, possible yeah. sleeper team. Yeah. I like, I I, I thought it was, I admit, hiring KJ, Sam Pittman. KJ is back at quarterback. I love KJ. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He's back. Yeah. yeah. They did lose Traylon Burks, but they got some, they had a kid they transfer in. Yeah. They got a kid trans, they had a transfer in too. But the at Arkansas game is key. They got to be competitive there. I mean, they can win the rest of their games. Kennesaw State, Miami of Ohio, Indiana, at Tulsa, home against South Florida, at SMU, who lost their coach. Right. At UCF, Gus Malls on, you know, whatever. Navy at home, ECU at home, at Temple, home against Tulane. I mean, they're, they're gonna run off the rest of their games. Yeah. Right. That first game is is the game. If they can win that game, they're I mean, so that's like to me. To drop them from a playoff team to not even in the top twenty, some right. don't even have them in the top twenty-five. Yeah, seems seems to be where if they can beat Arkansas, Sean, we could potentially be talking about them being undefeated again. Yeah. Now I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. I mean, they lost their offensive coordinator too, right? They lost their special teams coach. I mean, they lo- they lost one of their DB coach Ohio State. That's the thing that gives me pause is is they lost some really good football coaches, but they've got some play. I mean, Evan Prater. The kid that let me are they projecting Evan Prater to be the starting quarterback? Because he was a four star recruit and he was a good football player coming out of high school. Let me see here. Yeah, they have Evan Prater projected to be the starting quarterback this year. He was a four star recruit coming out of high school. You know, Corey Kiner is their running back. He transferred in from LSU. Yeah. He was a four star running back that had a Notre Dame offer. Jaden Thompson was a dude for them last year. Uh, Tyler Scott was, he's the kid that smoked I, uh, Kyle Hamilton for a touchdown and they got all five starters coming back from the, on the offensive line. They're not going to be bums all of a sudden on offense. No. no. Right. I mean, no. and I look, I like Desmond Ritter, but I love their, their offensive coordinator, Gino Gadula. You remember him? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just, I look at him, Sean, and I know they, they lost a lot on defense. I get it. I, I get it, but uh, they got a lot of kids coming back. That like Jaheim Thomas, one of their linebackers, he's a four star recruit. Malik Van, four star recruit. Juwan Briggs, four star recruit. You know, so for all the people that love the recruiting rankings, they, they got some dudes. But <laughs> I just, I just don't see them going from playoff team to yeah. outside the top twenty five, like some people are projecting. Yeah, I, I just don't. And, and so, but the, the first game is going to be the key, Sean. I agree. That's going to be the key. They can beat Arkansas. Or even just take Arkansas down to the wire, and then run the table. Yeah, they're going to be a top twenty football team. Yep. I mean, they're well. I mean, if that happens, they're going to be in the New Year's Six Bowl because they're going to yep. get that Group of Six invitation. They're going to yep. be the highest ranked Group of Six team at that point. Then. All right, Clemson. We had know. a hard. We had, this is interesting because because part of us wanted to have Clemson in the overrated category. Yeah. Because. I mean, like people are just assuming Clemson is going to jump back into the top four, and they, like Lindy's has them in the playoff. All right, they have them ranked fourth. I'm like almost. I think the lowest I've seen them ranked is fifth. Yeah. And and my thought is why? <laughs> right. Like, well, okay. Reason number one: track record. Okay. Yeah. Right. Reason number two: that defensive front seven is going to be filthy. I'll be honest okay. with you right now, though. 
You can say whatever you want about Notre Dame secondary. I would not trade their secondary for Clemson's. Would nope. not. Would not. They have Notre Dame's two best secondary players are better than Clemson's two best secondary players. Fact. Now, the difference is, is Clemson has a better front seven right now. Absolutely. And they're one of the few teams in the country that I think can say that. Can say that, yep. And and their front four especially. I mean, we can maybe debate linebacker. You know, maybe they're much better than Notre Dame. Maybe Notre Dame's better than them, depending on what you think of Maris a little foul. But to me, it's like they're just they're just better, right? With all due respect, I love Notre Dame's guys, but they're just better. But offensively, I think they're just there's this assumption that I think people are still working with the assumption that DJ Uwe Younglele is a five star quarterback, <laughs> and. I think they're working with an assumption that last year was just a down year for them. And the problem is me, you, Vince, all called Clemson's fall off last year. Because what we saw in 2019 and 2020 is what nobody else saw, which was they had two dudes on that that football team. I'd argue three. I want to throw Amari Rodgers in there. But they had three guys on that offense in 19 and 20 that masked a lot of holes on that football team. Yes. And that was Trevor Lawrence, Travis Etienne, and Amari Rogers. And they were just able to out talent some people, which is why they got embarrassed the way that they did in their postseason games in those two years. LSU just, uh, just worked them. Now, that was a great LSU team. They had, I mean, Trevor Lawrence had to put that team on his shoulders to beat Ohio State. They got outplayed by Ohio State on almost every other position except one quarterback. Yep. yep. 2020, they went and played Ohio State, and even Trevor wasn't good enough to rescue that team. Right. And and uh and then they come out last year, and I was not at all surprised by their struggles last year. I mean, some of the teams they lost to surprised me, but we predicted them to fall off last year. Yeah. Because, and I don't think that's all of a sudden been fixed because Tony Elliott's not, as if he was the problem. That dude was the offensive coordinator for two national championship teams. Can we stop pretending like he was the problem, right? From a from a play calling standpoint, the problem is the quarterback stunk. <laughs> the problem is the offensive line stunk. Yeah. And the problem is they haven't recruited the same way. And they have started recruiting more highly ranked guys that don't fit that offense. Mm-hmm. Bunch of tall highly ranked possession recruit guys as opposed to you know the slots and the speed and the and that type of thing they went away from the recipe that worked even though they had their two highest ranked recruiting classes right are going to make up this team so i think their defense is but here's the thing here's the flip of that Sean for me and this is why i didn't put them in the overrated category their defense is nasty and outside of Notre Dame, their schedule is soft. Super soft. And that's why I could see them maybe finishing in the top 10, being the ACC champ, maybe being a playoff team, even if they lose to Notre Dame. Because at Georgia Tech, Furman at home, Louisiana Tech at home, at Wake Forest, I don't know what it is, but Wake Forest just does not know how to play against Clemson. No. Uh, right? Home against NC State. This is going to define their season, this stretch right here. At Wake, home against NC State, at BC, at Florida State. If they come out of that undefeated, they're going to be a playoff team. Because I even think if they go on the road and lose, Notre Dame's probably not blowing Clemson out. Even if they beat them, they're not going to blow. Their defense is too good to get blown out, in my opinion. If they lose a close game to Notre Dame, turn the ball over a bunch. bunch Yeah. Yeah. Blown out. Yeah. Yeah. It would have yeah, you're right, Sean. It'd have to be something like that. It'd have to yeah. be something like Notre Dame NC State in 2017. Right. Where you have a pick six, uh, you know, another turnover that sets you up a score, that kind of thing. Then they then they finish the year at three straight home games against Louisville, Miami, and South Carolina. I think Miami's gonna be a top 25 team. And 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 so that'll be a quality win. I think Louisville's going to be a decent team. I think South Carolina is going to be an improved team. So even if they lose to Notre Dame, they got a chance to have three good wins Agreed. if they're undefeated. Yep. So that Wake, NC State, BC, Florida State stretch of their schedule is going to determine whether they're a playoff team or not. I agree. I and agree. so I'm just – I could see them being in the top ten, even though I don't think this is a typical Clemson team. Yeah, very easily they could lose one of those – yeah. games as well like because of the quarterback situation the defense is going to have them in every game but they have the quarterback situation that could literally give a game away 
Because and you know problems. what I said about Wake Forest? For whatever it is, I don't know why, but Wake Forest just doesn't know how to play against – they just know how to play against Clemson. I'm, I'm going to look up the schedule now because I want to I want to kind of back up my point. But, like, to me, last year is a perfect example. I mean, we, we definitely know last year. And I just – I didn't understand why Wake Forest just – just when you – like that was the year that this was their year to beat Clemson. And not only did they not beat Clemson, they got destroyed. destroyed. Is now it does Wake Forest. They um, haven't beaten them since 08. Do they find a chink in the armor with Venables gone? Right. But here, here's been the 21 point difference, 24, 49, 60, 14, Mm. 22, 20, 14, 49, 29, they haven't had a, a single digit margin of victory since 2011 against Wake Forest against yeah. Clemson. Yeah. I mean Clemson has just dominated them. The flip side, BC under Jeff Halfley is not afraid of Clemson. No. No. Should have beat him 2 years ago, right? Yep. And almost beat him last year with outfield Jacoby. Outfield Jacoby. Yeah. And so now Clemson's got to come back to Boston College. That's the game that's going to determine both teams' seasons in a lot of ways. Agreed. That's going to be a really interesting game, Sean. I think part of it is, and somebody somebody said down there, they're talking about the the wake issues, the long mesh point. I think there's a merit to that because they try to do that long developing run game stuff, and Clemson's offensive defensive line is just pushing their offensive line back into the. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like Stanford had that recipe against Oregon for a few years, where they just right. beat them up up front. Right. Um, but, but, you know, that BC game is it because BC has given them a game twice in two years. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and look, BC gave them a game in 2019 as well, if I remember correctly. It was at BC. They won. No, no. It was 20, 2019. They killed BC. What year was it? With Trent? Was it to 2018 year? Yes. B, uh, Clemson beat them 27 to 7 in 2000 in 2018. Yeah. But if you go back and watch that game, it was a competitive game for a while. Clemson, yeah. like they because BC was beating them up in the trenches. Right. It's just they couldn't they couldn't they score. score. Right. But I mean, because here's what I mean, they here's what Clemson did leading into that game: 63 points, 41 points, 59 points, 77 points, 27 against yeah. BC. You know, and then the next week, 35, 56, 30 against Notre Dame's great defense, and then 44 against Alabama. Right. So Clemson is an interesting one, Sean. I just don't know what to do with them. No, they are the enigma of uh, right. the 2022 football season. It's like right. it could go either way. Yeah. It could go I could see him as a play. Way. I could see him as one of the a not very good playoff team, and they'll get destroyed in the playoff if they right. make it. And then the other one is, is I could see them dropping. Look, if they lose to BC, I could see them. I could see them dropping a few. I, I really could. I'm yeah. I'm going to pull their schedule back up here, because here's another team. I'm I'm we'll we'll go through the conferences like at some point. But at Wake Forest, do they turn things around? NC State at home. Are we right or wrong about them? At BC could be a loss, but if they lose to BC, it would not completely shock me if that team gets shook and goes and loses and the next week at Florida State. Yeah, 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 yeah. Florida State's another interesting team this year, Sean. This is a very me. important year for Dabo and that program. Yeah. Just big picture. Mm-hmm. Very important year. Yep. To because I think they have a pretty good quarterback that's come into campus this year. And if they can kind of reestablish themselves and build off of that with, with him going into the next mm-hmm. couple of years, I think they'll be okay. But like you said, if they falter a little bit, it could be the end. Yeah. 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 And he's made some questionable hires, questionable because they're just unknowns. It's yeah. a bunch of former players. Yeah. His O line coach has never been an O line coach. He's a former player. You know, promoting Brandon Streeter to the offensive coordinator job, former player. I mean, 
he's hired a lot of those kind of, I mean, the, the defensive coordinator now yeah. is a guy that a couple of years ago was like the personal assistant basically to Bruce Arians. Right. You know, you know what I mean? Like, so that's who you replaced Brent Venables with. You know what I mean? Like you had a Ferrari. It, it's, it's, you had a Ferrari and yeah. you handed the keys to some dude that was a valet. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, that's it's, a great, no, that's a great. Now analysis. it's either going to be really bad because he's a freaking valet or he's a valet who's driven a lot of cars and he knows how to drive that sucker. Right. right. And right. he may not be a, you know what I mean? He's, like it's going to go one or two ways. A street racer. Right. Right. <laughs> you just didn't know it. This is what he did kind of as a side hustle to, right. you know, uh, so it, it could go one of two ways, right? Yeah. And, and I just don't, I don't know how it's going to go. Yeah. But they're a very intriguing team for me. Yeah. And and here's a sleeper team in the ACC. And I'll leave it at this: Florida State. Florida State has a lot coming back. They were a team that last year is a lot like Texas. They just didn't know how to win. Yeah. They lost in overtime to Notre Dame. Lost by three points at Jacksonville State. Blew a lead at home against Louisville. Lost by eight. Lost by 10 at Clemson in a competitive game. Clemson put away late. Yeah. Lost to NC State convincingly. Then they beat Miami, beat BC on the road, and then only lost by three at Florida. Yeah. They're another team that was not – I mean, if they can learn how to win, they're going to surprise some people. Yeah, Travis. And the Clemson game could be the game. There's two games for me that – that could go a long way towards determining Florida state. And I think if, if Norvell doesn't show promise this year, he's never going to do it. Yeah. He just won't get the patience. Yeah. He's got two chances to really make a statement. Number one, and they're LSU on a neutral field in game two. That's game one for LSU. That's game two for Florida state. Yeah. They played Duquesne the week before. And who was a, I think a playoff team, FCS playoff team last year. Right. And then, you know, by week and then, you know, at Louisville, tough, BC at home, tough, Wake at home, tough, at NC State, tough. Like, this is a tough stretch. But then if they can just be like, if they can beat LSU and let's say they lose two of those games and all of a sudden they're four and two, all of a sudden you beat beat Florida State or Clemson at home, you're now, what, five and two, six and two. You've got Florida at home, Louisiana at home, Georgia Tech at home, at Syracuse, all winnable games. And then you lose at Miami. Yeah. All of a sudden, you got a nine and three year, and you've turned this thing around. Right. If you can beat Clemson, so LSU and Clemson, but if you lose both of those games, you have no chance of being over five hundred. Right. In my opinion. Right. Yep. So that's a team to watch, but that that Clemson Florida State game is going to mean a lot for both teams, and a Florida State Clemson game hasn't meant a lot in a while. No. So it'll it'll be interesting to see that. So uh, that's it, Sean. Man. I did four hours yesterday, three and a half today. I'm not going to talk to anyone for the next two days. Please rest. So, bro. Yes. Yes. I missed I, cause I went three days out doing a show and I had a lot to say. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I loved the show. Uh, everybody. Thank you all so much for being with us on a Saturday. Uh, had tons of fun. We'll be back Monday for our recruiting hour. And Sean and I will be back next week. We're going to have some really fun topics for you again next week. Yep. Uh, we'll, we don't know what they're going to be yet. They will be determined during our phone conversations <laughs> during the week. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. So make sure you hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Share the podcast. Sign up for the message boards at boards.rsbreakdown.com. Check out all our sponsors. Tons of stuff in the merch store. Check out the Lucky Lefty podcast, obviously, as well. You had two former Notre Dame greats that played on the last two elite Notre Dame football teams, 88 uh, and 93. Yeah. So you want to check that out as well. And, uh, of course, we can continue this conversation on the message board. If you sign up, $4.99 a month or $49.99 for a year. Yep. And I love what we got going on there so we can continue this conversation. So for my man, Sean Davis, I'm Brian Driscoll. You all are IB Nation. Thanks so much for joining us on the Irish Breakdown Podcast, and we will talk to you again very, very soon.